Lakefront Parks and Environment meeting for CB4. It's, it's been a while. Um, we had a long break, so it's nice to see everyone back from summer. Uh, we are conducting this meeting through Zoom by order of the governor. Um, extending public virtual meetings, uh, which started, originated from the pandemic. So we are lucky, I guess. I guess we are lucky to keep going on Zoom. I guess lucky for some, maybe unlucky for others, depending. Um, so like I was saying before we started recording, we have a, a, a pretty strong agenda tonight. Um, we are planning, since we had a little bit of a break, we are playing both Hutz River Park Trust and New York City Parks are here tonight to um, present just some updates on both some construct construction that's going on, some projects, uh, so we can talk to them about that. Our, our third, if you guys look at the agenda, um, our third item is, uh, it says here, Con Ed to discuss Pier 98. So before we get into the agenda, um, I just wanna do a little bit of explaining about that uh, for those on the committee and also those who are, um, uh, attendees uh, from the public. So we expect to have an informative discussion, which is stemming from a recent article in the New York Times. Uh, I don't know if everyone on the committee or everyone who's here read the article, at least that's what brought it to our attention. So there are claims that uh, was listed in the article, which may translate into a lawsuit, it may not, that Con Ed um, is, they, so Con Ed, uh, for their substation and, and for, for other, uh, other stations up off of Pier 98, they take water in from the Hudson River. And, and I, I'm simplifying this, everybody. They take uh, water in from the Hudson River and then they use it to cool some of their cables and then it, it gets um, put back out to the Hudson River. Now, there are some claims that that is not being done um, I guess, environmentally safely, uh, we will talk about it. But I, the reason why I bring it up now is because we do expect to have a discussion on it. So uh, Marty and I, uh, along with Jesse and Jeffrey talked about this before the meeting today, we are going to limit public comments to two minutes. So if anyone has to talk about that particular subject, we're gonna limit to two minutes on that. Um, we don't want to cut anyone off. So if there's more to say, we'll definitely get have everyone have their time. But we just want to set the parameters for that early so everyone understands um, where we're coming from. Marty, did I, did I miss anything on that? Or Okay, great. No, you didn't. Great. And not only is Con Ed here, but we're really happy to have uh, DEC here on the topic. And also, Hutz River Park Trust will also talk on the topic because all of them are kind of involved in, um, I don't want to say lawsuit. I don't know if it's exactly a lawsuit yet, impending lawsuit, or however we want to characterize it as. Um, so I'm expecting uh, a lot of good questioning from this committee. Let's see, but, let, but let's, why don't we get to the other things first? Um, our first item on the agenda is uh, New York Parks. Is Parks here? I don't know if I saw it, did I see? I'm here. Uh, can you hear me? It's Elizabeth Nacella. Oh, Elizabeth, hi. Sorry. Hi. <laughs> um, well, I'm happy to just jump right in and we won't take up too much of your time just sharing a couple of temporary public art projects coming to Bella Abzug Park this fall. Um, so for those of you who um, don't know me, I'm Elizabeth Nacella. I'm the Senior Public Art Coordinator at NYC Parks. Uh, we permit temporary public artworks in parks citywide. Um, temporary public artworks um, can be sculptural, like you'll see. Uh, we also permit murals. I think the last time we were here was the basketball court mural at McCaffrey Playground. Um, so I hope you've seen that. Um, all projects that are permitted through our program are funded by the artist or the exhibitor. Um, artists and exhibitors are also required to maintain general liability insurance for the duration of the exhibition and maintain uh, the works throughout. Um, the first project I'm going to share, um, and I should also mention I'm joined tonight by uh, Bella Conway from the Hudson Yards Hell's Kitchen Alliance. Uh, she's the marketing and programming manager there. I'll give a brief overview of this project 
and the next one, and then Bella might just say a few words about um, the second project, which is being commissioned by the Alliance. Um, so the project you're looking at here um, is part of uh, the Armory Offsite um, Initiative, uh, part of the Armory Fair that is happening at the Javits Center right now. Um, the artwork was actually installed yesterday, so the picture you see is the artwork as it is on view uh, now um, in the park. And you can see in the lower left corner a map with a star marking where it is on 34th Street. Um, so the artwork is by uh, Mexican-born artist Juan Capistran. Um, it is also presented by Curro, uh, which is the gallery based in Guadalajara, Mexico. Um, the artist, uh, his work often deals with critiques of American culture. Um, and I can just say a few words about the work. Uh, so this text-based sculpture um, is rooted in the context of sundown towns and redlining across the United States. Um, sundown towns, or also known as sunset towns, um, are a the practice of form a uh, practice of form of racial segregation uh, by excluding non-whites. Um, this work takes the form of a quaint, large-scale greeting sign uh, that welcomes viewers with a picturesque sunset landscape uh, painted within the letters, but it says "get out," which is a commentary um, on that motif. Um, it's made out of automated automotive paint on wood and metal. Uh, with a wood-based structure. Um, it'll be on view for three months, um, so it'll be there until December. Um, it's six feet high by four feet wide. Um, next slide. Um, this is the second, this one that you're looking here uh, is part of the Armory Offsite Initiative. We had one work in Bella Absog Park uh, last year, which is shown here, was also there for three months. You might remember that piece. It had um, made out of shipping pallets and showed um, two mirrors um, so viewers could interact with it. Um, next slide. Um, so this is the next project. This has not been installed yet, but it will be installed uh, late next month in October um, and be on view for 11 months. Uh, this project um, is being presented by the Hudson Yards Hell's Kitchen Alliance. It's called Shadows. It consists of 10 works. Um, on the map, you can see where the works will be. Um, each sculpture is made out of steel. Um, and after I go through the description, we'll just show you some examples of the artist's other works. So you get a sense of that. Uh, but it's formed steel outlines um, and they are secured in the ground uh, with small concrete bases. Uh, the Alliance is overseeing uh, the installation there and they'll be hiring a contractor familiar with the landscaping. Um, next slide. Um, so these are some examples of the artist's previous work. The one all the way on the right was in Tompkins Square Park uh, about nine years ago, um, but the works will take these outline forms. Um, and Bella, I don't know if you just want to say a few words about um, the individuals depicted in the outlines um, and the artist. Thank you. Um, so we are working with Fanny Allier. She's a French artist and we were introduced to her through Common Ground Arts, an art consultant firm we've been working with. Um, and Fanny did a residency um, with us this summer, really like observing everything going on in the park day to day. And she decided to focus on our maintenance staff, um, groundskeepers and sanitation workers in the park. And so she did some in-depth interviews with them and drew sketches of their bodies as they worked in the park. And so those are going to be the, the sculptures and they'll be represented by their first names. So we're really excited to see this come to life um, to demonstrate how important um, our staff are in bringing the park to the public. And there will be um, an audio component too. Yes, we're, yeah, we're hoping that's still <laughs> in the works, but yeah, hopefully an audio component that will be on the signage with a QR code that will either be an interview or a sound that um, each staff member associates with themselves. I think that's it. It was a quick run through, um, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, you know, we always like promoting art uh, in our district. Brad? Yeah, could you explain to me the get out? I want to, as I 
always love the art, but you know, we have a lot of people being moved into our district. And me personally, I'm glad we we're able to help. But I don't really like the sign that says get out. I'm just gonna say that. I think it might be a little poor timing what's going on now. Could you yeah, explain to me again what the get out? Maybe uh, that way I understand a little bit more. It's about get out of nature. I'm just trying to understand. Yeah. Because it, it could be seen as a bit uh, poor timing on what's going on right now in our community. Yeah, I will um, note there is signage posted with um, the artwork from the artist explaining the artwork on site. Um, but it is the artist's work. Um, the artist is um, from Mexico and it is about um, sundown towns and redlining across the United States. Um, but it's done in this kind of way that looks maybe a little quaint in a way, uh, the way the lettering is, um, you know, laid out, but maybe the meaning behind it is a little more sinister. So I think it's speaking from the artist's experience um, in that sense, but I do see it could be received differently and we'll definitely monitor um, how this plays out. And if anybody has questions or, or complaints about it, you can refer them to us and we're happy to have a dialogue um, on that as well. Um, I think this was also planned before um, some current events came into play, but I do appreciate the feedback on that. Yeah, maybe it needs to be a bit more described before, you know, in the, in the cue card or the, the signage around what it means. Um, or it's a sarcastic take on telling me to get out, but I just I think it's something. Um, I mean, it's just poor timing, I guess. Right? It's just. But I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Yeah, there is a sign posted there with context as well, and on the artist background as well. Thank you, Brad. Brad, it's funny that was my knee jerk reaction as well when I first saw it. It was just a. Yeah, I, I went for a second, I thought the exact same thing you did. Anyway, Mirno? Yeah, I, 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 I see where Brad's coming from with the with the with the signage. With it, would it be in in Spanish as well, or in another language, or is it just going to be in English? Um, right now, it's just in English, but I can go back to the um, partners in the exhibition and ask if we can also add a Spanish language sign. I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Elizabeth, how long are these are these uh, up for? Or is it different times? The one uh, get out is up through December, early December. So it's about three months. Um, the other project that we discussed uh, will be up for 11 months, but it will be installed at the end of October. Brad, is that from before or again? So oh, I was just wondering, um, is there any art in the pipeline that are from artists in our district? Um, not, we don't have any other artworks, um, in the pipeline for, uh, this district at this time, but we're happy to speak with any artists who you might know who might be interested, either who live in the district or have studios in the district. Um, we're also happy to take suggestions of parks where you, that you would like to see programmed as well. Well, I would say this, I mean, we bring it up quite a lot. I mean, it's not that I want to say here's an artist, but maybe some of the criteria to get into the park might be that you must be within the CB4 for this area. This area uh, is a CB4 artist area. So I, I just think it's something we need to be looking at. Of course. Thank you. Anyone else for Elizabeth or Bella? Um, I have a, a comment to make about the get out uh, sundown sculpture. The We had those discussions at length with our board um, about the provocative aspect of the sign, but uh, inherently the meaning of the, the sculpture is that no one should be told to get out of, of the neighborhood. And it's the pro provocative nature of it is to reflect on that historical uh, his like that historic yeah the history of redlining and that 
there were certain communities that were asked to get out in the past. And so I think it's asking us to question that and to be more welcoming in the future. So that was kind of the conclusion we came to with our board. But I understand at first it does, you know, catch people by surprise. But I think once they stop and read the signage, um, it's it's a more welcoming message. Yeah, and I think that's key what we were saying. I mean, I get the the, the hard line of it and, and I get where it's coming from because you want dialogue. But I think it needs to be explained and to the other board members point, I mean, it should be in Spanish too. Thank you guys. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you Parks for the art update. And I'm, I'm guessing what we'll expect uh, uh, Therese or Steve to give us a fuller update next month. I'm guessing on overall parks, but this was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank Always. you. Of course. We should, we should re-emphasize re Brad's point about artists in our district. We have said that on many occasions, and I didn't want you just to hear his voice saying that. There are others who would like to see people from our district at least be vetted before you select artists. I don't know if it would be helpful if you if you're um, if CB4 has like an arts committee or anything, we'd be happy to do an info session anytime just um, to get the word out to artists. Because I think there are some artists who might qualify but don't know we exist or don't know how to do it, and we're always happy to just share that information. Um, we do. You know, we have an Aces committee, which which comprises arts. It's the first one. It's the A. <laughs> um, but we, we'll get we'll get information to you, and hopefully okay, we that would be great. Yeah. That would be good yeah. too. Awesome, thank you. Okay, um, so Hudson River Park Trust, I know you guys are the third item with the Con Ed agenda also, but uh, before we get into that, why don't we go into a lot of the, um, just the updates of construction and projects just to get us up to speed. Sure. Hi, everyone. And I know we will be brief on this unless people have questions, because I know there are a lot of people here for the next item. Um, so Kevin Quinn, our senior VP of design and construction, is going to start this off. Uh, we could talk a lot more about any one of these, but he's uh, he, he and I both are committed to keeping this short. So, Kevin. Hi. Hey, Janine, could you uh, bring up the PowerPoint? Yep. Give me one second going to give you guys a quick update on the three main projects we have going on and then uh, an opportunity that uh, I think we've discovered. Okay, so happy to give you this update. I'll be as quick as I can here. Um, next slide. So the first project is the Purity 4 dog run uh, that we just completed. So it's open for business. If you want to stop by uh, with your dog, please do. A uh, new spray shower, a new surface uh, with paw-friendly surfacing. The fences have been redone. There's a great water feature. Some bulkhead um, stones have been reused. Looks pretty good. So please stop by. Uh, next one. Chelsea Waterside Park, project underway. Uh, you guys are familiar with the design, I believe. Um, next slide. The, this is the comfort station underway. You can see the stone work uh, is looking pretty cool. Those are all recycled stones uh, from the original uh, construction that we've cut up and reapplied uh, to clad the comfort station with. And that's working out pretty well. Next slide. Kevin, there's a, just as a reminder, because I know this is of interest to this community board, there are solar panels on the roof for that building. And we've just completed a, a, a negotiating an agreement with Con Ed for us to return any excess back to um, the grid. Very true. We just signed a net metering agreement with Con Ed. Thanks for mentioning that. Uh, this is the Chelsea uh, Waterside picnic area. It's in the middle of the park. It's the stone seat wall that surrounds the picnic area. Again, those are blue stone uh, stones that are cut up pavers from the original installation. So we're recycling as much stuff as we can from the original build. Uh, next slide. And this is the dog run that will be opening by the end of this month. Um, they're just polishing the spray shower area right now. 
The remaining work is the color coat, the paw friendly coating. Uh, some wood seating is kind of half installed right now. And the main thing is the fencing that goes around and divides the small dogs from the big dog area. Those fence panels are sourced from Canada and we have some supply chain issues, but we think we have those conquered and we will open by the end of the month with those fence panels. If not, we will put in temporary tents, fence panels that will allow the, the park to open safely for the dogs. So next slide, please. Pier 97, a uh, major project. Uh, this is a rendering of what it will look like when it's done. It's about 35, 40% done right now. Uh, next slide. This is a shot from uh, what we call the top of the Belvedere underneath the shade structure. You can see the perforated metal above uh, and you can see the Via building um, to the east. Uh, the shade structures are all completely done and we were there on a very hot day and I'm pleased to say that the, the shade really works well, cuts the temperature down by 10, 20 degrees uh, and it has a really great pattern on the ground. It doesn't show up in this picture, but I think um, you're all gonna like it very much. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is the all ages slide at the kind of at the end of the pier to get from the higher level Belvedere down to the, the walkway grading. Uh, this is the foundation for it. It's not the finished slide. The finished one will be much smoother, I promise. Uh, and it will be uh, granite. And then we have the stairs uh, to go up and down so you can walk. Uh, but I prefer to take the slide down. And then uh, the next thing we'd like to talk about is an opportunity, uh, a pickleball opportunity. So, All right. So the last time we were presenting the design for Pier 97, so quite a while ago, and after we had had quite a number of meetings in our public process about the design concept for Pier 97, a group of uh, pickleball players came to the community board for a meeting and were inquiring about why there was no pickleball on Pier 97. And we promised at that point that while the design for Pier 97 was effectively done at that point and had completed its public process, that we would speak with them separately to explore opportunities elsewhere in the park to uh, consider pickleball. And we have found um, a spot for that in the unimproved area, essentially just south of Pier 76. And we can go to the next slide. There we go. So for those of you who are familiar with this area, it's within the yard area that we currently use for composting, some of our plant materials and um, assorted operational needs. We realized that there was an opportunity to consolidate some of our operations and to combine some pickleball improvements with some other necessary work, basically pavement and other safety related items for our own staff's operations in that area to introduce what we call an interim public use, an interim public improvement while we wait for this area of the park to be permanently landscaped as is our commitment to you and to everyone. So I'm gonna ask Kevin to uh, identify the layout, the rationale for the layout and um, show you a little bit more here. Sure, um, next slide, please. So this image uh, on the top, that's kind of a zoomed in aerial view and you can see the heliport barge uh, to the left on the south side. Um, that barge actually isn't there anymore, but when this photo was taken, it was and our compost area and then some storage. And then you'll see to the right of that image, it's more uh, stonework and bulkhead pieces and things like that. You can also see that there's some ponding in the area, which makes it a little unsafe and difficult to use right now uh, for our maintenance people. So we had plans to repave this area anyway um, to make it safer and easier to use. So that presents an opportunity that we could also, since we're repaving it, or at least part of it anyway, we could pave some of it nice and flat and level and turn it into an interim pickleball court. So the image on the bottom of the page, the line drawing, uh, is the same area that's showing in the aerial above. And you can see that we can fit in four pickleball areas. Um, it's kind of a, the colored area. The area to the north, uh, which is right of the page, we need to leave um, just clear paved area. And that's because that's where our larger trucks, it's the, really one of the only places where we can pull in a large truck, offload it and deliver the supplies 
to the rest of the park. So we need to keep that area open uh, where that gate is and that curb cut. But just to the south, it presents this opportunity uh, for the four pickleball areas in a seating area between um, the two sets of pickleball areas. They're oriented east-west, um, which when we walked the area with the pickleball um, expert, let's say, um, she was fine with that orientation and actually liked it. Uh, and it actually happens to work out just kind of perfectly with the dimensions that we have to work with. So that's pretty nice. The two little tiny rectangles to the south of the most southern pickleball area is a DEP structure. So that kind of limits the expansion to the south. So we may do a little bit of repaving uh, and definitely some tidying to the south of the area, but the interim pickleball area is really just the colored area that you see in this plan. We'll have two ways out. Uh, the fencing will be improved so that it contains the pickleballs. The grading will be flat. The pavement will be color uh, coded, kind of like a tennis court. Uh, fencing to meet pickleball standards and striping to be the pickleball dimensions. Uh, and that's um, pretty much it. We're looking at also providing some solar powered lighting uh, that we, we have some in stock that we can potentially reuse here if the math works and the lighting, uh, the foot candles work. So we're, we hope to do that as well. Uh, any questions on that? Would no you talk Would you anything? talk about access to the areas south of the pickleball? Sure. Um, for our own uh, staff, uh, there's a couple gates. Um, it's kind of hard to see in this plan, but there are a couple mm -hmm. gates. It's actually easier in the aerial. Um, in between the compost area and where you see the old docks being stored there, there's a little V uh, inset into the fence. Those are gates that allow access into those storage areas and our smaller vehicles, the Motrex, golf carts, things like that, can travel down the walkway and enter those areas, which is what they do right now. And I think you said the large trucks can't go over the pickleball area because you have an intermediate structure mm. thing that you're not allowed to go over? No, the, um, what I, or, what I meant to say anyway, is that there are two little rectangle boxes to the south of the pickleball area. That's a DEP structure. So that's as far south as we want to go with the pickleball area because that requires some kind of engineering and things to deal with with the pavement around that. The area for the trucks is the open area to the north and that will remain just open area with nothing in it. And that will allow the larger trucks that we occasionally get for deliveries to go in there and be offloaded, which is honestly pretty infrequent, but this is the only place we can do it. So we need to keep it. And then you use the smaller vehicles to move whatever is offloaded to the rest of the, wherever they need to go. Yeah, correct. Which Thank like you. I said, is really infrequent, but we gotta, we have to allow for it. Thank you. Brad. Listen, when Hudson River Park Trust comes to us, look at this today, Marty. We've got solar in the park. We've got reused material. We've got the dog run open. It's pretty amazing. And then they give us pickleball. <laughs> I, I have to say, you know, you guys are great. Really, this is the, the, the community has been asking for this. We, we really thank you. And I, Brad, my only question is, and how Brad, do we? Uh, yeah. Brad, they said solar before you did. I know. I mean, I have to say, it's really great. Thank you, guys. But you both um, said solar before we did, so there you uh, go. Yeah. We, we tried to hear. <laughs> yes, we really appreciate that. And I know you were working on some renewable energy uh, for the pier that's under construction now, but we appreciate it. Uh, what's the access like? Do they? Is it just open? Uh, is there going to be some tournaments? Uh, has any programming been thought out? Uh, um, to teach some local kids. I'm just wondering, um, you know, how it's going to be programmed, but thank you. So that's a good question. And maybe that's one that Community Board 4 wants to think about or talk about. From our perspective, it's a court like basketball courts, um, unless there's a special event of some sorts that someone comes to us for dedicated permission for. We might do something like what we do at the tennis courts. Uh, which if you're familiar, we have a time limit on them and some benches for waiting. Um, but we really haven't thought about it. If you have ideas, we're open to it. But, you know, we, we from our perspective, we're introducing a use cheaply um, in a way that, you know, hopefully people can benefit from while we will wait a better park in this area. And if you have thoughts about programming, um, well, we're all ears. And in terms of physical access, uh, it'll be 
fenced off with a better uh, fence mesh to keep the balls in better. Uh, but we will also provide two ways. Anytime we enclose an area or when I work on a project with an enclosed area, we always provide two ways in and out of that, of that area. Thank you, Brad. CB4 can sponsor the uh, Hudson River Park Trust Pickleball Tournament. CB4 Pickleball <laughs> Tournament. Yeah, and I know that the the New York City Pickleball, I don't know, they call themselves the Alliance, uh, but I'm sure it's the same person that was walking this. Um, I'm sure we could talk to them about some ideas and some local education on how to play the game and maybe get them access for a tournament. I just think this is great. Thank you, guys. And Brad, just so you know, I've been talking offline uh, with them as well. And we're also going to have the same conversation with Parks about this. Um, I, I do have one question. I'm sorry, Candice. Before I go, is there, Noreen and Kevin, Is where are the nets? Are they put up, put down? Are people bring the nets? Or is there some sort of storage? Or The posts will be permanent. You know, they'll be set in the asphalt. And I... As it's maybe it's an operational question, but when I when I when the contractor finishes it, there will be a permanent then uh, permanent net attached to those posts, just like our tennis courts. So, okay. below Pier Forty. So people won't have to set it up and stripe each time they play. Right. Oh, wonderful! Great, Candice. Hey, thank you guys. I think this is great, and looking forward to it. Um, my question is: Is there going to be any drinking fountains included in this area? Maybe. Mm, that's a tough um the answer the short answer is no because there's no water in that area we would have to bring in a whole new water service so in the when we finally redevelop this area of the park we obviously provide water service and drinking fountains during that but here we cannot do it all right thank you yeah i'm sorry gwen You, you had you it. Unmuted no, you yourself, had it. and then you, you remuted yourself. You had it. You had it. Unmute going. yourself. Push it once. You're uh, you're muted still. You got it. You're unmuted. Okay. No, it took me. A, it, it it's slow to respond for some reason. Um, I was running into this yesterday, um, but my my comment is that I just spoke with a neighbor who plays handball. And I said, what is all this thing with pickleball now? Because it, you know, there were news stories on it and all this kind of thing. And he said, well, it's all the rage at the moment and everybody's calling for new courts. And he more or less said, you know, we're not quite, he didn't say this, but he, I got the impression that he felt it was too soon to tell if it was a fad or not. And he said, you don't, and he ended up by saying, you don't want the same thing to happen to it that happened to the bocce courts. He said, I was by a bunch of them the other day and there was nobody there. Mm -hmm. And it was a normal time that they would be. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, and I think that that's the blessing of this being interim courts for the moment. Um, you know, there's minimal ish investment for us here to make this happen. We'll see how it goes. Um, and then you will all have the opportunity once we select a design team for this whole geographic area north of 29th Street and south of Pier 84 to weigh in the way you did for Pier 97 and Chelsea Waterside for what you want the park program to be. And, and the broader community will have that opportunity to do that as well. But generally, courts Sorry. require a flat surface some kind of fencing and um, you know, if you change the nets or you change the dimensions, you know, it's still usable for something. So even if pickleball disappeared entirely in a year, which I don't think will happen, somebody could play bocce on it, you know, I mean, or, or whatever it's, it's flat. And it, instead of the uneven surface there now, there'd be a way to use it for some kind of public recreation. Okay. I think it would be interesting to have, you know, how long this is supposed to last as far as the, you know, the materials involved and um, and how expensive it's going to be. So we don't have a full um, sense of that yet. We just uh, we recently retained a, uh, an on-call landscape architect 
to help us develop the kind of plans for this. And they're again, relatively minimal improvements, but uh, we will um, have that firm do that kind of cost estimate for us. Um, and uh, then we'll have to bid it because it's public procurement and that's the way life works. So we will <laughs> have an estimate before we can pay the bill. Right. And, Thank and you. I think worth mentioning, you know, it, it's asphalt we, and it's asphalt that we kind of need to do anyway. Oh, okay. So. I think I'm going to be expressing the committee's uh, feeling that we're all delighted to see what was not publicly usable become publicly usable for our community. And uh, echo echoing Brad, uh, we thank you. Great. Uh, Kevin, what was the timeline again? I'm sorry, what was the estimate of this? Uh, well, as Noreen said, we just hired a, a landscape architect just to make sure all the dimensions are right and the asphalt was the right mix and stuff. Um, so we'd be developing the, the actual plans uh, pretty soon hoping basically next summer for use. Next summer for use, okay. Thank you. Um, anyone on the committee uh, questions about any of the uh, Hudson River Park Trust updates, construction projects? Anyone in the public questions about that? If not, we can get to our uh, third agenda item. Um, I see Deborah and Martin, I'm gonna bring them over. Please, thank you so much, Jenny. Is Deborah over? I see Martin still in attendees. I don't know if Deborah's here. Okay. Hello. Oh, Deborah, there you are. Oh, great. Sorry. I just I this is my first Zoom meeting, so I'm not exactly sure what I'm doing. I apologize. Um I wanted, as regards to the Hudson River Park dog park that's going to be reopening at the end of the month, I would like to ask that we put on the agenda for next month, the future of the temporary dog park, which is over here in Chelsea. It's the Penn South dog park, which is extremely disruptive to those of us who live in Penn South and face the dog park. Because of the location that was chosen, it's in a narrow sliver of a city park that is in between two low rise buildings, which amplify the sound of the barking. And I'll spare you the barking, but it starts today, it started at 7.45, even though it's supposed to start at eight. And it has been going on all day. And I'll just give you a little bit of the barking. <laughs> And it goes on all day long. And it was promised that this would be a temporary dog park, an experiment. And then once the Hudson River Dog Park and the Madison Square Dog Parks reopened, which are both exactly three blocks away from here, that this temporary dog park would close. But now they want to make it permanent and it's just been so stressful for us. And I'd like to ask that that goes on the agenda for next month's meeting of the Parks and Waterfront Committee. Deborah, we can actually do you one better. Um, okay. That uh, we expected this. That that whole Penn South playground uh -huh. is, has been um, approved for full renovation, including the basketball court, courts, the 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 children's playground area, and that would also include where the temporary dog run is right now. Okay. Um, we are in talks, and this is for everyone too in the committee. Mm -hmm. So this should be on our agenda either next month or the month after. We're going to talk with New York City Parks about starting the public discussion for that um, planning um, in totality, not just the dog park, but with everything. So that I, I'm sure this will come up as well. OK, well, but this dog park that's right here has been so disruptive for the whole summer. We can't sleep. We can't nap. We can't work. And it has sort of set neighbors against neighbors. And once the other dog park is open, there really will be no need for this one as it's only three blocks to two beautifully renovated dog parks that have the wonderful asphalt that they were talking about that's paw friendly and the water treatments and the beautiful benches. 
And so I would like to have an end in sight mentally, because this is driving a lot of us crazy of this actually closing and not just dragging on forever and ever or for the rest of the year, because we have been tried to be good neighbors and accept that people do want some place to let their dogs run. And they have run all summer and they have barked all summer. And there are wonderful dog owners who try to stop their dogs from barking. But the issue is that the dogs bark. And yeah, we're, someone... we, we have, we've also been getting um, emails on this as well. So okay. we're, we're, yeah, we're very much aware and it's definitely going to um, be a, a major part of our discussion moving forward. But it's okay, a planning so... process and, and your, your timeline and, and the planning timeline are probably going to be different. But the dog parts inclusion or exclusion from the design of the new park is definitely an issue that this committee will need to discuss. And uh, the community that attends those meetings will, and yourself included, will uh, will join that conversation to design whatever the park, whatever the new park will look like: basketball courts, play equipment, uh, water features, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And, so, he, and even and Deborah, even before that, because I know that planning a new park is going to be a very long, long process and building it will be even longer. Um, we have definitely noted um, your comments and especially that since the other dog parks are open, um, then it changes the landscape literally. So we noted that and uh, and we'll discuss this in the next meeting or the meeting after moving forward. Okay, so Thank if you. I have something that I want to present, how would I do that? Uh, we can get you, Janine can get you um, our email, our office's email, and then we can uh, talk about that moving forward. Is that okay? Okay, great. That's great. Thank okay. you so much. I really appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Martin? Um, do we have the first speaker about uh, the... No. No, Martin. Martin is is from the public, and his hand is up. He wants to talk on Martin, the... not this Martin, but that Martin. I'm sorry, Martin Sweeney, from the public. Comments. His hand is up. I thought you were moving the agenda. No, sorry. Janine, I'm I... sorry. That was a mistake. Oh. Your hand, hand up is a mistake. To, supposed to be up. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so I guess we can move on. Now, yes, now, Martin, we can really move on. Go, go ahead. Do it. To the agenda. So uh, the third um, item on our agenda is what I was briefly explaining at the top of our meeting. Um, we are here with Con Ed, um, Hudson River Park Trust. Um, but I think, excuse me, I think Con Ed is going to present. Uh and I think, you know, why don't I just let Con Ed present and then we can get into the discussion afterwards. Con Ed, who is from Con Ed going to take the lead on this one? Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Kimberly Williams. I'm the director of Manhattan's Regional and Community Affairs Office at Con Edison. Thank you for inviting us to speak tonight and to discuss this issue. We are going to have a presentation. It will be presented by Venetia Lannan, our Vice President of Environmental Health and Safety, and Frank Cuomo, our General Manager from STEAM Services. And after the presentation, we welcome any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So I'll jump in from here. Again, I'm Venetia Lannan, good evening. I'm Vice President um, of Environment, Health and Safety at Con Edison. And as you heard, I'm joined by my colleague, Frank Cuomo, General Manager from STEAM Operations. Um, and just wanna thank um, Community Board 4 for having us here this evening. It's great to have this opportunity uh, and to be with you. Um, so we're going to be talking this evening about our operations at Pier 98, which as many of you know is at 58th Street in the Hudson River. Um, and in particular, uh, a, a notice letter um, that we recently received from a, a local citizens group stating their intention to sue us 
and the State Department of Environmental Conservation and the Hudson River Park Trust for alleged violations of the Clean Water Act at Pier 98. So we're here today to talk about our operations with you and to um, review and to refute the allegations in this notice letter. Um, and also to answer your questions, and um, which we're going to do at the end of the presentation, which we look forward to, and really hopefully uh, allay the community's concerns about some of the assertions that you may have read recently um, in the press. So if we go to the next slide, um, we'll share here the key takeaways that we'd like to leave you with from this evening's presentation. So first of all, I wanna be very clear that Con Edison has a valid permit for its operations at Pier 98 and operates in compliance with the permit. Um, and we're gonna be talking more about all of this, but it's only in very rare instances where discrepancies have occurred um, that we've identified those discrepancies, we've reported them to the DEC, and the DEC has stated that they consider these instances minor. Um, I used to work at DEC, um, and I can tell you for DEC to say publicly in the press that they consider discrepancies minor is significant. And again, we'll talk more about all of this. So in addition to meeting our permit requirements, recent water quality sampling shows that discharge at Pier uh, 98, with one exception for copper, which I'll be getting into, would meet New York State's stringent water quality standards for activities like swimming, kayaking, and healthy fish propagation. Uh, I think that's really important to underscore. With regards to the temperature of the discharge water, which you may have read about in some of the media pieces, water discharge temperatures um, from Pier 98 on average are 78 degrees Fahrenheit, levels well within compliance of our DEC um, permit. Uh, Pier 98 supports water dependent uses and critical operations providing power and heat to the west side and midtown Manhattan. So you go to the next slide, we'll talk more about those critical uses and, and set the context here for the presentation. So again, you know, you're very familiar with Pier 98's location, but here it is at the top left of the um, map there in yellow. Uh, and Pier 98 supports operations at two of Con Edison's facilities. One is the 59th Street Steam Station right across the street, also highlighted in yellow, just north of the Via building there and um, uh, also supports our 49th Street electrical substation highlighted uh, down on the bottom left of the map. So just a, just a word about these two facilities. The 59th Street st steam station, I think a very beautiful uh, landmark station built in 1904. It uses natural gas to produce steam and that steam is supplied to approximately 1600 buildings in Manhattan for various essential uses like heating and air conditioning, hot water. And the facility also importantly has the capability to produce 20 megawatts of electricity this is provided to the local substations and neighborhoods. And this is really important to provide reliability during peak load events. So, you know, recently when we had the heat wave and everybody's air conditioning was on, this, this kind of backup capacity for electricity is really essential to keep the neighborhood uh, resilient and running. With regards to 49th Street Electrical Substation, that's been uh, in operation since 1978, providing over 923 megawatts to nine local networks on the west side of Manhattan, serving about 80,000 customers and really critical uh, facilities like the Lincoln Tunnel, the Port Authority Bus Terminal, St. Luke's Hospital. Um, you can see the others on the slide here, major subway interconnections. Um, it is not an exaggeration to say that Pier 98 supports some of the most critical infrastructure on the west side of Manhattan. So if we go to the next slide, we'll zoom in on Pier 98 and also zoom out a little bit before I turn it over to Frank to talk about um, the, the technical operations. So we've operated at Pier 98 since 1959, before I was born. And um, we are currently a tenant of the Hudson River Park. We pay the trust an annual rent of about $1.3 million. 
And before I zoom in on, on the uses of the peer that we're going to talk about, I'm going to zoom out a little bit and say how Pier 98 fits into the city's waterfront revitalization plan. The city designates Pier 98 and the, the lands underwater adjacent to it as a priority marine activity zone. And what that means is that this area is specifically intended to support maritime infrastructure and water dependent use uses. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of those water dependent uses and the ability of us to receive barges, for example, here uh, is really critical. I'm gonna be talking about that. It takes hundreds of trucks literally off the road every year. So this is um, on one hand, a, a priority marine activity zone um, designated for these types of important water dependent uses, but we're also cognizant that the pier sits in, um, in uh, the marine um, estuary sanctuary. So it's we are balancing those two needs, which I really think is the goal of the city's waterfront, um, the city's plan for waterfront revitalization. Um, I can't underscore enough how uh, seriously we take the mission of protecting the, the marine habitat here. So let's take a look first then at the critical activities that take place at Pier 98. So these um, yellow rectangles here are our two barge berths and Frank's manning the cursor for me. Thanks, Frank. Um, and that's where we receive fuel oil deliveries. Now, as I said, 59th Street steam station across the street runs on natural gas, but in winter during the heating season, when demand for natural gas is really high, it's really important that we have this fuel oil here um, as backup supplies. And we get deliveries uh, about four, four or five months um, out of the year, um, up to five times a year, we receive um, deliveries of fuel oil, um, a, a critical use of this pier, water dependent use of this pier for us. Um, in the middle of the pier, you'll see it says substation cooling equipment and system. And Leslie, I think, did a good job of, of starting to describe what, what happens here. Frank's going to describe it more, but basically where it says substation cooling water intake below, that's where um, Frank, the yeah, the water intake gets the the Hudson uh, River water gets pulled in, goes through this equipment, uh, doesn't touch anything, it's just in pipes, and then it gets discharged at outfall three. Um, and you will be talking a lot about outfall three, so just want to orient you. That's under the pier, outfall three. Um, these stars that you see are all monitoring, water monitoring locations. So inside the building, there are temperature probes in the pipes um, that we measure the temperature of the water continuously before it's discharged into the Hudson. So that's important. The other monitoring that happens on the pier will go to the SUNY River temperature gauge. Um, here. We are hosting SUNY Albany. Um, this is unrelated to any of our activities, but they're doing um, climate change research uh, measuring the ambient temperature in the Hudson River, which is really interesting um, for, for climate change um, studies that they're working on. But they share that data with us and we'll share it with you. And it, I think it, it turns out to be important background data um, regarding the ambient temperature of the Hudson River in this this um, location, given its criticality, especially for fish habitat. Um, lastly, I'll point out the star number two, which is closest to the to the West Side Highway there. Um, this is outfall two is the discharge point from the, the uh, 59th Street steam station. Frank's going to talk to you more about it, but basically we take drinking water, we take city water, we boil it to make steam and the output of those processes get discharged here. Um, importantly, we also have a monitoring and sampling station there where we monitor that discharge continuously for pH and for temperature. So with that orientation to our activities on, um, on Pier 98, I'm going to turn it over to Frank, and then I'll be back to uh, walk through the, uh, the assertions and talk more about the environmental side. But I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Frank, to talk about our operations. All right. Thank you, Venetia. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Great. Thank you so much. And good evening, everyone. My name is Frank Cuomo, and I'm the general manager here in STEAM operations at Con Edison. I'm here this evening to talk to you to give you a basic overview of our main operations at the Hudson River outfalls. I'm going to start with outfall three. 
this is the outfall associated with the substation cooling system serving the 49th Street substation. So let's just really start with the basics. What, what is the cooling system and what does it do? Uh, this system provides cooling to critical electrical transmission cables during the summer. This allows those feeders to operate at higher loads and move more energy when your communities need it most. Uh, and that's in the summer, as, as Venetia described. This system operates uh, approximately 118 days consecutively each year, basically the, the entire summer pre period and a little bit before and after. To describe how it works, I, I'd like to start at Pier 98. Uh, so if you look at this, uh, if you look at the diagram, there are three separate loops that make up our system. Loop one is the river water loop, and it's depicted here in purple. As you can see, there's not a lot of purple there, but the river water loop is re really not a lot of equipment. It's located solely on Pier 98. Loop two is a freshwater loop, and that's depicted here in blue. Uh, these two loops exchange heat via a dedicated heat exchanger located on the pier. Loop two travels down to 12th Avenue and 49th Street to the substation. So if we can continue these blue lines down and we'll pick them up here and they continue all the way down to the substation on 49th Street. Once they arrive at the substation, it exchanges heat with loop three that's depicted in green. It is here that the heat from the electric transmission cables are picked up and routed back to the river via the same exact route. And if I skip forward here to the schematic diagram, uh, it really shows a simplified version of the process I just described. There are three loops working together to transfer heat from electric transmission cables to the river without coming into direct contact with each other. Each of the loops are broken by a dedicated heat exchanger. So there are three independent systems working together to serve one common purpose. Moreover, I would like to reiterate that the river water does not leave Pier 98. It is taken in through a pump, it has gone through, it goes through a heat exchanger, and then it comes out of here at discharge number three that Venetia described earlier. And it comes into contact with very few pieces of equipment during its brief journey out of the river and back into the river. Our second major operation that I wanted to talk to you about is uh, the 59th Street station proper uh, and its relation to outfall number two. Uh, and I really want to give you a simplified overview of the station. Uh, if it, we start at a very, very high level, the 59th Street uh, steam station is one of six operating steam production facilities serving the Manhattan Steam Network. This station is one of our smaller stations, being approximately 12% of our overall capacity. Uh, most hours of operation occur during the winter periods. And while the station only operates 25 to 30% of the entire year, it provides a very critical redundant capacity uh, source to ensure our customers have energy 24 seven, 365, no matter what equipment issues we've run into on the remainder of the fleet. <clears throat> So this is an oversimplified uh, diagram showing what happens inside the station and how the steam is actually processed and made. Uh, Venetia gave us a little bit of a, a teaser earlier, and I'm going to go into a little bit more in depth now and tell you how it relates to outfall number two. Uh, while the overall processes could be quite complex, they really can be boiled down to some, some very basic and relatable elements. Uh, first, the process starts with just plain old drinking water. The same exact kind of water you would get from your sink or your shower goes into the station and into our process. Uh, while the minerals in that water may be good for us to drink and to consume, the boiler equipment would prefer pure H2O. So our water treatment systems start the process of purifying that water to get it down to its most basic elements. Uh, at this point, we start to filter the water, remove all those natural minerals, this is kind of similar to how you would, how you would describe a, a Brita type filter or a filter that you use in your house or in your refrigerator that purifies your water before it goes into your cup. Uh, this water treatment system will remove all of the minerals and then try to get us down to pure H2O as much as possible. Uh, that process, that water moves into our boiler systems and you could equate this similar to a, a tea kettle. It's essentially a, a vessel that holds water. You add heat to it. 
and steam will come off the top. And, and I want to note our steam is of FDA quality because it is used in hospital sterilization as well as food processing. So there are strict requirements on, on our steam and the quality of it that comes out of our treatment facility, out of our facilities. <clears throat> the water is treated and, and monitored similar to uh, a tea kettle or, or to, uh, to a process, all the minerals that are pulled out of the process need to be collected. So those are the streams that are shown down here and they go into our pH balancing and monitoring systems. Uh, they are monitored uh, 24 seven, they are, they are looked at, they are balanced to make sure that before the water enters or is discharged to the outfall, uh, that it falls within the parameters that we have set in our station and uh, that are on our permit. While I've made this diagram look very simple, there are a number of stations, monitor sensors, and even a dedicated control room and control room operator that coordinate this entire process. In addition to the main boiler equipment, we have some ancillary supporting equipment, such as drains, trenches, and overflows that are routed through our water refinement process prior to being discharged to outfall number two. At outfall number two, as Venetia described earlier, we have continuous monitoring for pH, temperature, and flow. This concludes my operational overview, and I'm gonna turn it back to Venetia, who will review some of the major assertions associated with the citizen suit. Thanks, Frank. I like how you said you were going to boil it down. I just noticed that was a great pun. No, no pun. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm going to go through the uh, major assertions um, from the citizen suit and uh, refute them, as I said earlier. So let's start with the first one, if you want to advance the slide. So um, the, the notice letter that we received um, asserts, and I'm just going through the major assertions here, that we are not operating at Pier 98 with a valid permit. This is not true. Con Edison operates at Pier 98 under a valid DEC permit. Our current permit number is on the screen here. This is a state pollutant discharge elimination system permit. Some of you may have heard the term Speedy's permit. It's valid under the State Administrative Procedures Act called SAPA. So we have a valid DEC permit. Um, in terms of the timeline of that permit, we uh, submitted a permit renewal to DEC back in 2016 prior to the permit's expiration date. Um, DEC was in the process of evaluating that permit. Um, and then in October 19, we requested a modification to accommodate a process change at the 59th Street steam station. So as part of that permit modification process, DEC is conducting a, a full technical review as, as they are charged to do. So that is sort of like when you, when you have a process change in a permit like this, DEC takes the time to really, really look at it closely um, to, to make sure that, uh, that they understand everything and that they are able to, to regulate it responsibility. That review takes time. And so while the permit renewal date has passed, the permit is still valid and it's extended under SAPA, as I mentioned earlier, until the DEC issues the renewed permit. Um, again, if that's not clear, not everybody speaks permittees, we can answer questions at the end, but um, the, the State Administrative Procedures Act is really in place to provide this extension time for, that allows DEC to do their due diligence and their review uh, under a uh, full technical review. So we have a valid permit uh, um, uh, for Pier 98 discharges. So let's go on to the next assertion. Um, the second uh, assertion is that we operate in violation of effluent standards. We do not. We operate in compliance with permitted effluent standards. I'd like to read you um, a, a statement that DEC issued to ABC News on August 24th. Um, they said, since, uh, in, in response to these allegations, DEC said, since 2010, of the 4,400 sampling records at the Con Edison plant, DEC identified 27 reported exceedances and non-reporting of operational parameters unrelated to the outfall at the facilities. These discrepancies were considered minor 
and quick uh, and quickly resolved. Um, again, for for the DEC to say that these are minor um, is is important. Um, but let's look at what they really are. We actually received, you can see if you can read the asterisks down at the bottom here, I'll read it for you, that um, we received an email on August 30th um, from DEC clarifying that their initial press response of 27 um, discrepancies was incorrect and that the total should be 26. So we're talking about 26. Um, so let's break down what's in those 26. So there are eight times out of the 4,400 times we sampled where we had pH excursions outside of our permit limits. Eight out of 4,400, okay? Then we had 16 events which relate to something called total suspended solids. And that you can think of as sort of like the, the cloudiness in the water, like the water was too cloudy. Um, and, but and if you can follow, follow me here, 14 of those 16 had nothing to do with the quality of the water. They had to do with the fact that we, um, our sampling wasn't aligned with when we had flow. So, um, you know, we had a scheduled sampling, but there was no flow. Um, so those you can think of, I think, more in the administrative foul, if you will, bucket, rather than anything impacting water quality. Um, likewise, uh, there were two times that we had uh, flow discrepancy uh, events where basically um, the plant, as, as Frank said, the plant only operates 25 uh, to 30% of the year. So there are times where we didn't have flow um, and we weren't able to uh, capture, capture samples. I don't want to minimize the, the 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 administrative fouls as I'm calling them. They're important, and we're seeking to improve our performance always. Um, and with this regard, we want to do better. But in terms of impact to the river, this is a molehill. Um, as I said, and we'll continue to underscore, we we self-identify these issues. We report them to con uh, to DEC, um, and they uh, considered them minor and quickly resolved. So let's move on to the next uh, assertion. So there was an assertion that we returned contaminated water to the river, and in some ways, I, you know, for me personally, this is the most important one. We do not return contaminated water to the river. As I've just described to you, the water we discharge to the river meets or exceeds permit standards, other than for those limited number of pH and total suspended solid events that I told you about, uh, which DEC considers minor. Um, so as I mentioned before, we are uh, we have a permit modification request into the DEC, and that's a trigger for DEC to do this full technical review. And as part of that full technical review, what DEC will say, okay, Con Edison, we want you to look at everything coming out of these two outfalls, uh, even if the, even if they're things we don't think are in your process we want you to look at 150 different chemical parameters to make sure that nothing is going into the Hudson River. What the lab tests came back, and I also want to stress, this was one sampling event um, for the permit. I think that the, the notice made a lot of hay out of these results. This is one sampling event, but the lab detected selenium, chromium, chloroform, copper, and lead. However, they were at such trace levels, such low levels, that they would meet state water quality standards for activities like swimming, kayaking, and healthy fish propagation, which is essential in a marine sanctuary. All with the exception of copper. Copper would not meet those high state water quality samples. Um, and these, the, the copper was detected in the outfall, uh, uh, excuse me, was detected at outfall three. And as Frank described to you, outfall three is basically, we're taking river water, we're sending it through pipes, there's a heat exchange, it's going back out. So there's no copper in that process. Copper is something that um, uh, occurs uh, in lakes and rivers throughout New York State. Um, things like manganese, iron, copper are very common in water supplies. So it could be that it's coming from the river itself, 
we don't know. But the point is, it's also at very trace levels. It just wouldn't meet those highest water quality standards. So I hope that puts things um, in, in context. We're not discharging hot, dirty water to the Hudson River. Um, if you could go to the next uh, assertion. So speaking of hot water, um, you know, the, the notice letter asserts that we're uh, returning water to the river at dangerously high temperatures. This is untrue. We continue to meet the requirements of our existing discharge permits and no readings have, existed, uh, have exceeded our permit thresholds. But we really want to get into this with you because it's important. So over the past five years, focusing on outfall three. So you remember there was outfall two and there's outfall three. Outfall three is really the more important one to look at. We're going to show you the data for outfall two as well. But outfall three is where you have that heat exchange. So this is the hotter water of the two. So we're focusing on that. So at outfall three, the hotter water, the discharge temperatures over the past five years for outfall three have averaged 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, 78 degrees Fahrenheit. But we're going to get into the blow by blow. The outfall uh, over the past five years has operated with a discharge temperature at or below 90 degrees Fahrenheit 99.8% of the time. Okay, I hope that's clear. The outfall has operated with a discharge temperature at or below 90 degrees Fahrenheit 99.8% of the time. So the monthly maximum temperature, which is something we report to DEC, uh, over the past five years, the monthly maximum temperature, that's the highest temperature that was ever recorded in a month, has exceeded 90 degrees Fahrenheit 11 times. Uh, but it's never exceeded the 104 that's in our permit limit. And I just want to take a moment before I turn it over to Frank, who's going to show you the, the, daily, um, uh, the daily temperatures. Um, you know, the, the notice letter makes a lot uh, out of this 90 degrees. The 90 degrees is a special condition that pertains to um, estuaries like the Hudson River is. And what it pertains to is the, the, the temperature of the surface water, okay? Um, and it doesn't pertain to the temperature of the water that's being discharged. It pertains to the surface water temperature, to the, which gets mixed. And I think what's really instructive, we talked about that Albany, uh, SUNY Albany temperature gauge, is Frank will show you um, the, the water temperatures at the SUNY gauge, which is you know, about 80 feet from the outfall, you'll see the water temperatures are already dropping on average like four to five degrees immediately upon hitting the water um, and, and dissipate out from there. So um, I, well, I wanted to just explain that point to you, but I'm gonna turn it over to Frank now to go into, uh, bear with us, there's just two more slides, um, into, the, into the temperature uh, data on a daily basis, and then we'll, we'll open it up for questions. Th thanks, Venetia. And, and you, you did a great job explaining it. I, I, we just wanted to add these data slides and just to give a level of context around uh, the, the, some of the stats that Venetia went over. So this chart that's on the screen right now is for outfall number three. This is the chart. This is the outfall with the heat exchange and the saltwater heat exchange system. And you'll notice, so we have a couple of streams here that I, wanna, I want to uh, identify. So the blue dotted stream is the SUNY river temperature. Okay, that's a daily average from the SUNY gauge. So that's measuring just the normal river temperature, not impacted or not anywhere impacted by the outfalls. Uh, if you look at the colored lines that are kind of scribbled around the, the top middle, that is the saltwater system. And you'll notice it doesn't expand the whole year because we only operate the system on average 118 days out of the year, or right around the summer period. So you, right away, you'll notice it's, it's a limited operation. The second thing you'll notice is it tracks pretty close to the river temperature as far as daily average. Uh, and as Venetia mentioned, we only had 11 instances where the temperature was <laughs> over 90 degrees. Uh, and if you just put a little timing or context around that, uh, the average timing for that, those exceedances, uh, was about three hours. So uh, on average, about three hours, we would be over 90 for a period of time due to the feeders needing uh, amount of cooling. 
Uh, and then as the load would drop off, as the temperature would cool down, it would drop right back below that 90 for those uh, rare occasions. So it's not something where if we do have an instance and it stays that way for a long time, it's actually a pretty brief and intermittent occurrence uh, that that occurs on, on, on rare occasions with that system. Uh, for, for completeness, we wanted to also include the temperature for outfall two, but as you can see, uh, it is not as impactful as outfall three as far as temperature is concerned, and it tracks pretty closely to the SUNY gauge. Uh, so what this graph really shows is that, uh, you know, the, the temperature at outfall two is, is really not of concern. Uh, we've had a, a very, very limited exceedances there. I think one exceedance over 90 degrees, and that lasted a matter of minutes. So, you know, that's, that's not uh, as concerning from a temperature perspective as outfall three. Uh, but you can see, we, for completeness, we wanted to show the data here that outfall two is really not concerning from a, a temperature perspective. With that, we, we just wanted to end with the key takeaways once again, and, and uh, I'll turn it back to Venetia to close us out, but uh, we, we'd be willing to take uh, any questions that the panel or the attendees have uh, after she uh, closes. Yeah, no, that's it. Great, great, um, Frank. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, we're just leaving the key takeaways up here uh, as we open it up for, for your questions, which we're, we're happy to take now. Right. Uh, just let me uh, interject here. I'm just wondering if it would be better for me to make a um, just an opening statement, um, and and then we can go into questions. Um, I think that I think that would be smart, actually. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, our you know New York State's uh, ongoing uh, commitment uh, to the health of the Hudson River estuary. Um, it's evident in uh, the significant water quality improvements that, that we have seen over, over time. And, and that is the result of decades of stringent laws, regulations, and extensive investments in the enhancement of the, the river's uh, uh, natural resources. Um, now, I also think it's, it's important to uh, Make a, a a number of notes of the um, with regard to the Con Ed uh, 59th Street uh, um, permit. Uh, many, uh, uh, I'm pretty much going to be reiterating what you have heard uh, largely from our, our Miss Lannan and and also um, uh, Como, uh, Mr. Como. Um, uh, with regards to the Speedy's permit and its status, but I think it's worked um, coming from our New York State DEC that we um, are, you know, essentially emphasize the status of the permit and and where we stand with regards to um, some of the allegations. Well, well, this permit, the 59th Street uh, Gen Station permit, is lawfully in effect and enforceable. Uh, um, the, the public health and environment is protected by this permit and the, uh, the limits are that, that are contained uh, within the permit. Uh, there are absolutely no toxic chemicals from this facility being discharged into the Hudson River. And, and I'm not going to go through uh, the various streams. I think uh, Con Edison um, or did uh, describe uh, accurately the various uh, stream, the streams uh, uh, that discharges to the Hudson. Um, uh, the facility currently has no outstanding violations and uh, all discrepancies over the past 10 plus years um, have been thoroughly investigated and, and rectified. Uh, the agency, this department, um, uh, continues uh, rigorous oversight of the station um, uh, to ensure compliance with the laws and regulations in place to protect public health and the, the Hudson River. Um, that's essentially it. I think it's important that I, I, I made that statement 
um, which I think is consistent with what you have been hearing um, uh, from Con Edison. Now we can open it up for questions. Or... Uh, thank you, Mr. Southwell. Mm -hmm. uh, we appreciate that. Uh, I just want to mention to the committee and the people um, uh, in the public that are on this Zoom, um, there are three components to this presentation. Well, one, obviously Con Ed um, presenting, but that's why we also have uh, Mr. Southwell and the DEC here. If anyone had questions for them, they were gracious enough to come to answer those questions. And if you're wondering why Hudson River Park Trust is here about this, because there's another component to this as well. So um, as Con Ed mentioned in their presentation, there were two main concerns about the water that was getting pumped out. One was the temperature. The second one was what's in the water. Um, now, uh, there was another concern and, and uh, Noreen, I think you said Robert was gonna talk about this maybe, um, that maybe we wanna go to him first before we take questions so we can get the full picture of this and there'll be reference, was that um, Hudson River Park Trust is the leaseholder because the pipes and all this goes through their, their park. Um, and there are some assertions, there are, are some um, comments that the mechanisms and the actions of Con Ed doing this process was not fully made transparent by Hudson River Park, whether that's true, whether that's not, that was some of the, the comments that have been said in their, in their open public um, process when the lease was was renewed, right, uh, Noreen? Renew or the, the yeah. public comment process. So if, and I know there are some questions from our committee and I'm sure there'll be some questions from the public, but if we can go to Robert, cause I think Robert pre prepared something, it will give us the, the full scope and then we can get into this, I guess, three-pronged dialogue. Great, thank you. Um, I know we want to get to questions and people want to do the technical stuff while it's still a little fresh, so I will try to be um, pretty quick on this. Um, first, I want to be clear that the trust's top priority is safety and public safety. Um, we know the time article was alarming to a lot of people, and we appreciate that DDC and Con Ed are here tonight explaining um, the uses at Pier 98 and that there aren't any health risks to the Pier 96 kayakers or others from the uses. Um, there's also every reason to continue to feel optimistic about the progress the river has made um, as it continues its journey of recovery from its like long, uh, its past long dominated by heavy industrial use. Um, beyond what DEC has explained, um, I think it's helpful that every keep in mind that when the Hudson River Park Act was passed in 1998, it was passed within a context that allowed for a public park to be built and also included in it a working waterfront, um, which is really a legacy we here have on the west side. Um, thus, like, so our public piers, our boathouses, our docks, and even habitat enhancements are built around tunnels and pipelines and internet cables and utilities and CSOs, all of which are part of the city's infrastructure system. Um, Con Ed's use of Pier 98 is part of that system um, and has been included in the park's general project plan from the beginning. Um, as Con Ed explained, the facility has existed at least since the 1950s and the heat exchanger was installed sometime in, I think, in the 1970s, um, all of which predates the park um, by decades. Um, when we were created in 1998, we inherited the, uh, the existing leases um, from all entities within our borders from New York City and New York State, including the one from Con Ed at 98. Um, in 2011, after taking uh, a, a significant action uh, public review process, um, the trust executed the current lease with Con Ed for the same location and uses that had previously been authorized by New York City um, because Con Ed had an ongoing need to use Pier 98 for its heating and power operations, as we just heard about. Um, the lease was updated in five main areas at that point. Um, first was a rent increase, um, the fence was improved, uh, the new lease obligated Con Ed to conduct a comprehensive inspections of their piles and bulkhead um, and make sure it made uh, require repairs in a timely fashion. Um, it also required Con Ed to conduct, uh, to conduct a, 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 any required environmental remediation in addition to removing its equipment and structures should it leave so the trust isn't on the hook for disposal or cleanup. Um, and the time frame is structured for 10 years uh, with two 10 year renewals, allowing Con Ed to leave, they no longer needed the pier rather than one long uh, 30 time, year time period. 
Um, the least approval, approval process followed our normal significant action process, which involved public notices, posting the then draft lease for public review, uh, a briefing to community board four, and a public hearing. Um, CB4 recently went through this process with Chelsea Piers and Intrepid leases in a pretty expansive way. Um, so I know we want to keep getting on. So on my final piece is um, we know folks were alarmed, both for public health and our Hudson River habitat. Um, and we hope that tonight has given some folks some level of comfort. Um, we work closely with DEC and a lot of our other governmental bodies too um, that regulate uh, health and safety on a whole spectrum of issues. Um, we have every confidence that uh, HRPT would be notified if any of our agencies partners um, became aware of concern that would affect park users or our neighbors. Um, and in turn, we remain committed as always to sharing that information uh, with all of you and our community. Um, and that I will, I will get off the stage here and turn it over to questions. Thank you, Robert, um, and thank you to everyone who talked and presented. Uh, Marty, Leslie, you I, to, I, yeah, yeah, go I ahead, want, Marty, before we I, go. I know Lowell had his hand up for a while and there's some others, but go ahead, Marty. I, I just wanna, I'm not, I don't wanna make a statement. I wanna ask a question of clarification. In the presentation, we were told that there were 11 exceedances in the, uh, in the past five years. The chart on page 16, only shows one exceedance in the past five years. Uh, could could you help me rec reconcile that? Yeah, yeah, Martin, I can. Uh, so the chart, because we take continuous data, we actually have like 15 minute data on temperatures. So for the chart, for simplification purposes, those are daily averages. So there was only one day out of the last five years where on the daily average, we were over 90 degrees. And that was a, that was a, a very rare occurrence. For all the other times, three hours were over 90 degrees, the remainder of the day were under. So the daily average is typically under 90 degrees. That That's the, the clarification there, that the chart represents daily averages. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Lowell. Okay, um, first my usual disclaimer, I'm a member of the Board of Hudson River Park Trust. So if there's any kind of vote on this, I will be voting present, not eligible. But I do have a question for Con Ed and DEC. Um, Major assertion number one with regard to the DEC permit. Um, you requested, uh, Con Ed requested a modification in October of 2019, which is what's basically led to the delay in the issuance of the new permit. Is that correct? I would let DEC, yeah, what, DEC yeah. can answer that question, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, that that uh, I would refer to as a delay. Um, the permit is um, undergoing a full technical review. So, um, but, but it, I mean, this this permit, the permit renewal was submitted in 2016. Is it safe to assume that if it wasn't for the process change, that DEC would have approved this permit sometime in the last six years? That's a, uh, I, I certainly um, in not a, in, is not in a position to say yes. Um, so uh, so it, it, it takes DEC at least six years to review a permit renewal. Uh, no, but it depends on uh, what what what's be, what's changing with, the, with uh, this particular permit. Um, or it, it it I would not uh, you know I, I don't want to say a yes. Um, but there, there are minor changes um, that, that occur at facilities over time, and each of those may, may add to the, the timeline in which the, uh, the uh, full technical review uh, may take place. Okay, second part of this question is really for Con Ed. Um, you requested a modification to accommodate a process change in October of 2019. For the last three years, where DEC has not weighed in on this process change. Has the process change been instituted or are you waiting for Con Ed to say, yes, you can do it before you go ahead with the process change? I could take that one, Venetia. Hi, hi Lowell, the process change was, was instituted. So uh, it, the process change was centered around a significant upgrade to our water treatment systems at all stations, not just 59th Street. Uh, but that that process change does uh, does affect the uh, the permit renewal and and the technical analysis was started from that. But uh, the systems are in place and and operating. Okay, so I, I, I believe that that's the installation of our our, um, our 
carbon dioxide neutralization to boiler boiler drains. Is that correct? Um, and I don't have the permit here with me, but um, yes, it, yeah, okay. it's neutralization systems, and also is the upgrade to the uh, the uh, incoming filtration systems. Very good. Okay, okay. so, so yeah. let, let me just answer that, and I think it's yeah. very important that um, I, I, I respond to that. Um, when a facility, and, and we have a number of um, facilities, um, uh, it's not, not, not limited to Con Ed, that would um, uh, propose improvements in their systems, uh, whether it's a, the replacement of an all water separator that's much more efficient than the one that's being replaced, or the installation of treatment when there was none. Um, we would not do anything to, um, we would authorize the facility um, to uh, install and operate because it makes sense, be, uh, it, it improves the ultimate discharge. Um, we're not going to make a, a, um, the fact that the permit is not yet modified uh, stand in the way of improved effluent quality into the, the, the Hudson River or whatever river um, based on whatever facility is. is. So there are certain um, uh, modifications and changes in facilities that are, we will allow to go ahead even though the, um, the, the, the permit has not been modified. Especially right, because, if because we're assuming we're assuming what Con Ed did was an improvement to the system, and that's why they did it, and that's why you you would let it go ahead even without the the permit being amended. Exactly. Supposedly we, an during, we're, and, and just um, just so you know, we are in constant contact with our Con Edison's Con Edison staff. Um, or believe me, uh, Con Ed has dedicated staff that reach out to us almost on a daily basis um, with operational information, um, or you know, if they're proposed or considering a change. Um, it's not just when the change is in effect, it's when Con Ed is uh, investigating, assessing, making any um, uh, uh, studies of changes that they, they uh, believe may improve the, the process and also improve ultimately the quality of the discharge. They um, work with us uh, from day one, from inception okay. of the idea. Okay, so because, none of these things come as a surprise to us. Um, it's, it's, it's something that my staff We'll work with Con Edison closely um, to, um, you know, from the beginning to actual inception. Okay, thank you for that clarification because when this was, when major assertion item one was presented, it wasn't clear to me what this modification was and what DEC's role was in overseeing this modification. It sounded like Con Ed could do whatever they wanted, make a change, and DEC will get to it eventually. And in the meantime, Con Ed could be doing whatever they want for the last three years. Yeah. So it, it's encouraging to hear the piece that you just added, Mr. Southwell, that, you know, that it's not just, well, we file the permit and then they approve it or don't, but that there's an ongoing dialogue between Con Ed and DEC. So thank Constant you. Constant dialogue that. between Con Ed and, and uh, New York State DEC. All right, because that, that wasn't clear from the initial presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Lowell. David? Um, you know, I wanna thank you all for the presentation and, you know, it, it speaks to your sense of uh, accountability to the community that you're here uh, and addressing us in such detail. And I think the point by point addressing of issues and the level of detail adds greatly to the credibility of this presentation. I'm convinced, but I've also just heard one side of the lawsuit. And, uh, you know, I'm wondering uh, why, if this information hasn't been shared with the plaintiffs, the case hasn't just gone away. Uh, what are still points of contention that uh, result in there still being a lawsuit? 
Yeah, I think I think to be clear, there there isn't a lawsuit uh, yet. There's just a, a notice um, of an intent to to file a lawsuit. So um, I, I really I can't I can't answer your question. I'm not sure. You know the the would be plaintiffs. Um, you know, have access to the majority of the information we've shared this evening. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm not, I really, I'm not sure why they would still want to continue to pursue a lawsuit, quite frankly, I don't know. And Dave, David, just so, just so you know, um, the people bringing the lawsuit is a, a, the City Club, which is a New York civic organization. They're on, they're here on this call. So they will absolutely get, if they would like, time to talk. Good, um, I, I want, look forward to yeah. that. Yeah, we just want to go through the presentation first and have comments and questions from the committee, and then we can definitely go to the public. All right. Have a more comprehensive discussion. And, and, and I'm guessing more comments and questions from the committee maybe sometime after that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Carl. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to echo the thank yous um, about uh, Con Ed and uh, DEC joining us tonight and, and addressing us with such detail about these um, assertions. I actually had a question uh, for the trust uh, about a comment in the New York Times article, which um, says that uh, the you know water cooling is part of the lease agreement as an acceptable use with um, Con Ed. Uh, but the, in the New York Times article, they even say that the public notice on the city register did not include water cooling as um, a use. So I'm wondering if you might be able to just address that point and confirm whether or not the public was given an opportunity to uh, comment on the water cooling process as a use on the pier. Thank you. Uh, definitely. So um, as I said, um, this is a use that a predates the trust by some time. Um, it was not an unknown unknown use um, when we were doing it. We were renewing an existing lease um, that the city had previously held. Um, and so it, the uh, public hearing notice is a very short piece of uh, advertisement for um, what is actually the proposed uh, lease. Uh, which does include it um, both uh, in, in pretty clear uh, specific things. Um, and we were actually able, able, able to also go find um, our uh, talking points prepared for uh, CB4, which also explicitly include um, a mention of the heat exchanger uh, for the use on it. Um, so it, it was out there, it, it existed, it was known, um, it's available. Um, and it's one of those things that I think particularly you see before um, recently, you know, read, read the Chelsea Pierce draft lease and asked a lot of very good, very specific questions on various pieces of it. Um, and it, it, this was all in there. Um, it's only about whether or not it made the cut for the ad. And we, I, frankly, we can't talk, can't say um, because we don't know and the people here are not here anymore um, about what was, how how that was written in 2011 um, for for the ad piece of it. Carl, anything else? Where is that? Was that the? No, I just wanted them to confirm that that was you know part. The assertion in the paper makes it seem like it was not part of the uh, uh, not part of uh, the, the 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 public did not know about it or have the opportunity to comment on it. It, it was included in the public review. Okay. So the new, you're saying that Hudson River Park Trust is saying the New York Times is erroneous in that reporting. Uh, so it, it is right that it wasn't in the public hearing notice, the short piece of like tiny blurb that goes in the, is published in the newspapers, okay. um, but it was in all the, all the lease and review documents. Okay. So it was in the big file, but not, Okay. Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, no, and, and we specifically mentioned it apparently at the CB4, according to our things, although we don't know exactly what was said or what the discussion was at CB4. Um, as you know, these things take different questions, but it was in our in the briefing for the talking points uh, to explicitly mention to CB4. Thank you. Mirno? Yeah, it's just just to that point, it just seems like it was it, it's material enough information that it would have been highlighted and not just uh, put in a big uh, 
regardless, um, my question is about the Times article that also mentioned uh, chromium and lead, and I know you you said that that the, it's very trace and it's completely safe. But um, since the water comes out of the, the river, goes back in the river, doesn't touch anything, only goes through the pipes. I'm curious, what are the pipes made out of? Is there? Um, I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, um, Frank can answer this. The pipes, a lot of them are made out of titanium. Um, but Frank, why don't you go ahead and talk to that? Yeah, so it depends what we're talking about. So on the uh, on the outfall where a lot of those uh, items were were uh, were found, that was outfall three. If uh, and uh, the the pipes themselves are, are mostly ca carbon steel, but the uh, heat exchanger does have titanium uh, titanium coils in it, right? Because it comes into contact with salt water, and salt water is uh, is very corrosive. Um, you know, there's not there's not uh, any real sources of lead or, or, or anything else in that, that small piping loop. Um, so it, there's not many places for it to come from, is, is the, the long and short of it. So copper and titanium? Uh, well, car carbon steel mostly. Uh, the only, the only, we have some brass fittings for, for temperature probes and things like that, but the, the majority uh, of it is, uh, is, is steel. And then the titanium heat exchanger are, are the components of that. Thank you. Brad? Yeah, hi, thank you, Chair. I just have a few questions, uh, kind of what Lowell was saying. Uh, the DEP, when is the permit going to be renewed or, you know, what's the timing of that? Uh, the, the, the permit um, will be, renewed or modified slash renewed. And uh, I did check with my uh, Bureau of Water Permits. Um, it's being drafted out of central office. Um, and uh, it's it, within several months. That is what they, um, it's, it's going through the full technical review. And by that, what that means is it's a fresh look. At, it's as if it's a new facility when you do a full technical review. You're looking at everything. Um, so it's, um, they say within the next several months, the permit would be out for um, public notice and everyone would have the opportunity at some point to um, chime in and give their, um, you know, their comments. Um, so that's, that's the, the best timeline that, that, um, that, that they provided to me with, within the next several months. So by the end of the year? Within the next several months. And, <laughs> and I'm going to hope that it's, uh, you know, that's, um, I, I certainly can't, um, you know, it, it, I would expect so, but that, that would be, um, going beyond what. Uh, you know, what they gave to me. Okay. Yeah, I think six years, you might have covered it, right? So I think we're almost there. That's good. I got a question. Uh, the instances that it went over on the hot water temperature, what was that temperature? And it lasted about three hours in almost all the instances. Is that correct? Yeah, no, so, yeah so the average uh, the average for outfall three, uh, any instance that was over was, was three hours. Uh, it's not, it's not, Brad, it's not at one temperature per se. It almost uh, looks like a bell curve where it kind of builds up to a temperature, it peaks, right. and then it comes back down. Uh, I, I think the closest we got on one day where that one instance that Martin was talking about, it was, it would just approach the, uh, the 103 mark for a very brief uh, moment, and then it started coming back down. But the majority just really peak over 90 and then come back down. I mean, look, all any energy problem or environmental problem, all it takes is one time, right? Oh, so I, I know understand. Yep. You're perfect. So as an environmental board, we have to say, obviously, that's a concern um, because boiling water, getting in there, kills a lot of things. Uh, I got one more question for the DEP regarding the, the copper. Have they investigated uh, where they think maybe this could have come from if Con Ed is saying it didn't come from them? And how do we approach that? I believe as part of the full technical review, 
uh, the permit writer would look at what the ambient uh, concentrations of copper is uh, in the within the uh, vicinity of where the conduits intake for that river water is, and make a comparison as to if that is uh, the concentration um, uh, of the river water at that location. If that is the case, uh, they may decide to put uh, copper in the in the permit and require no net increase. Um, and they may that's that's obviously no. I'm in speculation. I'm not the permit writer. However, um, I've seen that done before. If you have a a uh, intake, um, you certainly can't penalize Con Edison for what's in the river. So they, what they may do is um, uh, have Con Ed sample for copper on the discharge and um, uh, come up with a no net increase uh, scenario. Or um, that, that's just one possibility. Uh, I'm not the permit writer. Um, I've seen that done before. Um, so it's, uh, you know, but I do agree with, um, uh, with the folks from Con Ed that I, I do not see any um, our, our addition of copper um, through that process, uh, that uh, um, heat exchanger. I, I, I would be shocked if, if Con Ed is not adding copper to that discharge. So um, we would have to look for where's the source. Could be the river, who knows? Um, but um, I, what I gave to you before was just one way of handling it, or they may decide, they may decide there's no need to add copper because it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it, the concentration in the river is not going to be changed by, uh, these ones through, um, uh, through the, the heat exchanger. So it's, it's a permit writer's decision. And, and, um, that's something that, uh, once it's done, it will be available for uh, the draft. Will be available for, available for public uh, comments, and I'm sure anyone who is interested who um, would would comment on it if they think it um, it should be addressed differently to the way the permit writer actually um, handles it. And maybe and maybe just just going back to the to the temperature point um, to your to the comment that it that it, when it comes to the environment it only takes one time. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that's very well said and just want to underscore again we've never exceeded our permit limit of 104 degrees fahrenheit and just for context 103 degrees is about the you know the temperature of a hot shower just to kind of put that in context well you got a good shower mine doesn't get that i got out. a great shower <laughs> you got a great shower lucky you uh, my my last question is is there a shut off if it goes to 104 like if it was a 3 hour bell curve uh, and we've talked about people right on inside the lab, they're monitoring everything. Is there a natural shutoff? Is there a timing mechanism that will be part of this permit? So the, so the community knows that when this happens, it will be shut down. Like, how does that work? No, right, like right now. You were yeah, one right degree we can... off, right? One degree off. What happens at 104? What happens at 105? Yeah, no, we we continuously monitor Brad, but there there is no controlled shutoff if if we get to that point, right? We will continuously monitor, and if we exceeded the permit, we would report it uh, to to the DEC and then investigate why we exceeded that. Uh, we investigated the the high temperature that I mentioned before, that one exceedance that went that went pretty high, and it was associated with uh, the startup of uh, of one of the other loops as well as a high load day. So. Uh, it, you know, we, it, we don't have an automatic shutoff right now, but uh, it, we are looking into uh, the exceedance and seeing if there's anything on the control side that we can uh, take a look at. Frank, just one question for you. Um, what would a shutoff represent in terms of um, steam production? We're in January, it's January 15th. We got eight feet of snow on the ground. It's it's sub zero temperatures in the northeast. Northeast. What would a shutdown of that 
non-contact cooling, what would be the impact of that? Yeah, it's, so it's important to, to delineate. So it, the impact would be zero because outfall three is associated with the substation and it only mm -hmm. operates in the summer, right? For electric, uh, for electric cable cooling. So, right. you know, in the wintertime, we're out, outside of May and November, we're not operating. So it's, it's really a non-issue in With those periods, okay. right? But in the summertime, uh, a, a surprise shutdown, we would have to coordinate with our electric counterparts to see if, if they can accommodate the shutdown. But again, I, I just want to emphasize over five years of data, as, as uh, Venetia mentioned, you know, 4,400 monitoring, uh, monitoring points. You're talking about, uh, you know, one, one occurrence that we, we're going to look into and see if there's a way around it, whether we time the loops or, or whether we throttle them or something. Um, but again, did not exceed that permit limit of the of 104. Uh, it, it's something that we'll look into on the control side to see if there's any uh, anything we could do there to uh, to to mitigate this in the future. Thank you, Brad. Anything else? Anything else from the committee? Okay, um, we do have, uh, oh, I'm glad. Okay, we have one person from the public. If you could bring over Mr. Fox, Tom Fox. Um, so uh, anyone in the attendees section in the public, if you have a question or a comment or anything, please raise your hand and Janine um, from our office will bring you over so you could be heard. Um, I, I would like to request, though, if you're part of an organization, um, just identify yourself, who you are, where you're from, just so we have some sort of context. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to Mr. Fox's comments. So if anyone comments or questions, because I know if anyone read the New York Times article, Mr. Fox is identified as one of the representatives who is bringing um, this possible lawsuit. So uh, we will... Uh, predetermined, we will give him a little more, a little bit more leeway than two minutes, um, if he wants. Just so, again, as David was asking, to have the quote unquote other side or the the questioning of it. Um, so, Janine, is it possible to bring over Tom? And I also see um, Graham's hand is up as well. All right, I'm bringing them both over. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, great. Hi. Hi, Tom, do you want to start? How are you? Yeah, uh, just, 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 just because of this is the nature of this, can you just say who you are, where you're from, sure. just people have con. Thank you. You got it. Um, my name is Tom Fox, and I've been working uh, for and with the Hudson River Park for 40 years now. Um, I was the first president of the Hudson River Park Conservancy. Uh, helped to finish the concept plan, which allowed Con Edison to have a park commercial use at Pier 98. Um, and I am the citizen plaintiff in the suit, along with the City Club of New York, on whom, whose board I serve. Um, it, a, this is not the uh, forum to debate legal issues. Um, you know, we filed the papers a month ago. On the 10th of August, we have not heard back from Con Edison. So apparently they're choosing to deal with this in a public forum rather than addressing our concerns privately, but be that as it may. Um, their SAPA extension can only go for five years. Therefore, they do not have a valid permit. That's number one. Number two, the temperature in estuaries uh, in New York state is at 90 degrees. Con Edison asked for a variance for this facility to go to 104. We'd love to be able to have the studies from Con Edison and DEC that justified these increased temperatures. We don't have access to them and we couldn't find them online <clears throat> through our freedom of information requests. And by the way, I'm being advised by uh, US Army Corps of Engineers, former <clears throat> commander and district engineer for the Pacific Northwest and to environmental lawyers. Uh, I'm just a, a park aficionado, if you will. Um, two, why all the secrecy about this? I've been involved in this for 20 years. Uh, it's not on the Hudson River Park Conservancy's estuary management plan, which even calls out all the CSOs, yet all of this hot water and 
uh, other water coming out of Con Ed isn't even indicated. Members of the technical advisory committee of the Hudson River Park um, never heard it. The people that were asked to advise the Hudson River Park on the aquatic impacts in the estuary had no idea this was happening. Um, Venetia, good to see you again. Um, the, um, um, it's good to see everybody. I mean, this is an important public debate and I'm not here to condemn or uh, castigate anyone. I'm just here to see that the best possible outcomes there for the Hudson River, speaking for the fish, so to speak. They don't have a very loud voice. Um, the, um, so, uh, and by the way, the maximum temperature recorded by Con Edison at Pier 98 in June of 2022 was 103.1, according to the EPA, <clears throat> just so that you know. Yeah. 101.3, sorry. Um, um, so the, that's, I'm just telling you what the records say. Let, I can, him, let Mr. Fox I, talk and then we can, what we can go over the points. Yeah, I, I can't flash things up on the screen. I don't have uh, extensive and expensive presentations. I just have passion and information and have uh, a lack of a response from the people we've asked for information. We didn't sue. We said, we'd really like to talk, but we haven't had anybody to talk to. And nobody seems to be responsible and everybody's pointing fingers at one another. HRPT did not have it in their public notice. Flat out was not in their public notice. Madeline Wills signed the lease. She is available to talk to, I'm sure. Someone can find her. So if we want to know what happened, we can go to the individual that executed the lease. The trust was paid $4 million by um, DEC, deferred $4 million of the fine they had leveled on Con Edison for pollution, for um, noncompliance with the Clean Water Act in 2009, at the same time as the trust was negotiating a lease with them. Um, they received $4 million. They put out a public notice that didn't mention this. And then they signed a lease that did mention it. They didn't include it in the ESMP. Nobody seemed aware of it. Um, I'm just confused, that's all. And there was some clarification, but not sufficient to my liking this evening. Mr. Fox, may we may we pause there for sure. one second? And yes. just because there's some points you're making and I'm sure they want to respond to. Can we do that point? If yeah. they don't have to. I but I do have one question from what you just said about the temperature, and maybe this is to the DEC. Yes. Um it seems like we talk about temperatures, temperatures, and Connet said, well, we're we're you know, we're, we're hitting our temperatures, but those temperatures are measured uh, their variances, right? Those no, are normal they're, they're not. And I, I really need to explain oh, this. Okay. I, I, I really need to. Um, now, the uh, 104 degree Fahrenheit um, limit at uh, outfall 003 is not a variance. That is inconsistent. That is inconsistent with our, our with the department's water quality regulations, criteria uh, governing thermal discharges. And for those, who are so inclined, that's 704.2.B5. Um, I think uh, one of the um, uh, <clears throat> screen uh, presentations, um, I believe it's uh, Ms. Lannan um, provided some information that actually speaks a little bit to this. Now, the, the um, for an estuary, the maximum surface temperature allowable is 90. Outfall 003 is a subsurface discharge. Not at the surface, it's a subsurface discharge. No variance was needed to, for that permit rider to um, arrive at a maximum temperature of 104 degree Fahrenheit. That's number one. Number two, the discussion of a variance, and here's where the variance um, actually uh, applies. Um, th th this actually applied to, to the um, 
are the the word variance was was uh, actually applied in the permit as it applies to entrainment and our impingement requirements. Um, and at the time um, when that modification was made, uh, the permit writer deemed that the uh, frequency or the infrequency of the uh, cooling operations warranted that variance. That's for entrainment and impingement um, requirements. So that 104 is not a variance. That actually is consistent. It's in compliance with whatever word we, we want to choose. Um, it's that is not the variance, and that it is. It's a distinction that I think um, we discussed internally, um, are, and we decided we we were confused as to the use of variance, and we're like, no, the variance has nothing to do with the one hundred four. The variance has to do with um, the what you perhaps are aware of BTA requirements, intake requirements, um, entrainment, impingement. Um, that is it. Now the permit is undergoing a full technical review, so um, those may still be in the cards. I don't know. I am not the permit writer. Those things may be delved into. Who knows what? may emerge in the permit in the future. However, at the time when that modification was made, the permit rider, based on the infrequency of the discharge, um, the thermal discharge, um, made that determination that there, there, the, the need for entrainment and impingement was not necessary. So that's maybe, the source of some confusion for you, um, uh, Mr. Fox, I'm not sure. Thank you for that. Um, and I don't know if, I don't wanna get back and forth, I really don't, but I, I do wanna be oh, fair. I don't um, know. Yeah, I mean, if the Hudson River Park Trust wants to make co further comment on on anything else, that's fine. If not, that's fine too. Um, I'm just gonna, you know, let everyone have their say and then, uh, um, so, I mean, the only piece I think in there for us um, that we haven't already addressed was the ESMP concern. Um, and I don't want to make the uh, ESMP is our estuarine sanctuary management plan. Um, it is uh, our, our plan on what we are doing uh, for uh, and our goals for in the sanctuary uh, and managing it. It is woven into all of our work here at the trust um, as part of it. Um, everything from our operations to our public and programs and education department, um, really all aspects of the trust, our horticulture department participate uh, as part of it. Um, I don't want to make the ESMP and I uh, into something that it is not. It is not a compendium of every possible uh, risk to uh, the sanctuary. Uh, it, it does specifically mention um, discharges and uh, specifically the largest threat from the discharges, which is the CSOs uh, that are in ours uh, in, in, the, in there. And it, it, it speaks specifically to them. They're not our infrastructure. Um, frankly, the sewage is not created in the park. It, it comes to us in a pipe. Uh, it starts someplace else. Um, but uh, so it, it's, it, it, it's, that's, I, I can't say it, Yeah, what I can say is that, um, we are happy to try to uh, work with our technical advisory committee. Our ESMP is a living document um, to have folks um, dig in with uh, Con Ed and DC on all of these things. Um, and happy to happy to have, work with our technical advisory committee to see what, if anything, we want to change. Thanks, Robert. Um, I do want to go to Graham because I know he was brought over. He had his hand up. Hi, Mr. Virgil. Thank you so much for coming. Hi, I'm Graham Birchall. I'm president of the Downtown Boathouse. We used to operate a free kayaking program at Pier 26 between 2005 and 2013. And I've just really got some uh, questions to ask for clarification. Uh, the, the free kayaking does involve people getting in the water. Uh, it's just a safety procedure we have. But we only operate from late May to early October, which seems like that's not the same season that the steam plant is operating, it's operating in the winter. Um, so there doesn't seem to be any overlap. Uh, but I'm a little confused because I saw a chart showing the outfall two heat 
uh, and it was clearly emitting something all year round. Could you just elaborate on that, please? Yep, yeah, sure. So the the outfall the outfall two closely matches closely matches the uh, the SUNY gauge. The the probe is on the outside, uh, right at the discharge pipe. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times it it could be capturing the the temperature of the river. It could be capturing the the outfall. But there's there's a good mixture there uh, at the outfall. Uh, and the outfall of number two is is pretty intermittent. It's not a continuous flow. Um, so it could have nothing and it could have it could have flow, uh, but it, it pretty it tracks pretty closely to what the average river temperature is with some slight fluctuations around when when the outfall is operating. It's not as consistent as uh, outfall three, which operates once it's on, it's on uh, until the system is turned off uh, later in the year. But, but there is clearly something coming out of outfall two in the summertime. Uh, yeah, so we, we do operate the boils all year round. It's not just the winter. Right, uh, 59th Street, but we provide steam. The steam system is active for heating, domestic hot water, as well as air conditioning. Uh, mm -hmm. So the steam system is active 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. Uh, so the 59th Street can and does operate in the summer period, especially if we have outages on our major plants. Uh, but the primary operation for the station is in the winter period. That's when it operates the most, when the, the system peaks are highest. When there is no kayaking going on for-, for Correct. Right. Okay, correct. And, and then clearly you said it's a gas plant, but I see some, I see, always see some oil tankers there. Yeah. Um, and with gas, you know, nothing in, nothing out. It's just methane, mostly. So only, the only heavy chemicals coming out would, would be something leaching out of the pipes and you're mostly using titanium and other metals that wouldn't expect much. How often, if ever, do you burn oil? So I, I want to be very clear. So the titanium is associated with the heat exchanger yeah. for the salt yeah. water process. Inside mm -hmm. the station, we don't have much titanium, if any, uh, because we don't have corrosive salt water uh, running yeah. through there. Uh, so we, we have a variety of, of materials that we use in the station. Uh, to answer your question on the oils, uh, right now, as a system wide, we only operate about 3% fuel oil, 97% natural gas. And the only time we would operate fuel oil is at the very, very, very peak of winter, if the gas system is seeing a constrained period where the gas system you know, needs some relief, mm -hmm. we will operate on oil for a day, two days, maybe a three-day period. I think the longest consecutively we operated in recent history was the winter where we had the bomb cyclone and we had maybe like 12 or 15 days of freezing temperatures. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we operated maybe 10 days in a row on oil there. But again, it's very limited intermittent uses uh, but the barges are always there in case we do need uh, we do need a supply. Normally, it's one barge, and then in the winter time we bring a second barge in. Uh, and and so that's again in the winter, not conflicting with the kayaking um, adjacent. Um, um, the, the summertime will mostly be one barge, uh, just just you know for redundancy purposes and just in case. Uh, the second barge is uh, is temporary, just for January, uh, December, January, February. And again, excuse me, but you know, I'm a bit of a chemist by training and I know what's in the oil, um, but I'm assuming that doesn't get into this hot water system. Would that be a fair statement to make? Yeah, no, the, the oil, the, the oil is contained in our oil distribution system. It's vigorously monitored and reviewed and inspected. And it, again, it's seldomly used, right? Um, and then uh, when it is used, it, the oil goes right into the boiler. It is uh, it is used in the boiler. It doesn't come back out. Okay. Any sulfur or other things in the oil you deal with through that process, not yeah. doesn't get into the water. Correct. Through our emissions, yeah. our emissions monitoring. Yep. All right. I mean, I, I think I'm fine. I think I could assume that there is no impact um, on the kayaking program adjacent. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll also mention we have a pretty rigorous oil spill drill program that we work with. Uh, we work with local authorities and we do that once a year as well, just to simulate what we would do in, in that case and how we would react. So we're pretty vigorously trained and proceduralized around something like that. With, right. the, Coast Guard, with, the, with the Coast Guard. I would make a comment that we were never informed of any of this in all the period we were there. And even though it's harmless, um, it would have been nice to have been on board with this so we could answer questions uh, about what is going on. And I would just encourage that in the future, right? Thank Silence, you. you know, can encourage paranoia. 
um, because there are other things that are being dumped in the harbour, right? So, you know, we were there a long time. Be nice, good, if you were good neighbours, you know, and just showed up and told us what you were doing, be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Um, anyone else from the public? I don't see any more hands up, Janine, um, unless you do. No, I don't see anyone. Okay, and David, did you, I know you were waiting possibly to comment. I don't know if you had comment. Um, okay. No, it's, it's good to hear from uh, all parties. Okay. Um, I guess this is done. I guess, I guess we can put, we, we can wrap this up. Not, not, not for the committee, <laughs> but, oh, Tom, go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. I just wanted to point out that um, this plant has been non-compliant every quarter for the last three years, um, according to the EPA. Um, and again, I ask why the secrecy? Why, what did it take us so long and our action to get people to actually fess up to this and start discussing it in an open process? It just doesn't feel right. Um, and I look forward to the opportunity to speak technically with your folks and our Army Corps of Engineer and legal folks to clarify the situation and hopefully avoid litigation because in absence of hearing what we need to hear, that's the route we're going to be going, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank thanks, you, Tom. And uh, thanks for being here. Uh, sorry, Michael and Caitlin just raised their hands from the public. Okay, I'm sure. Gonna... While you bring them over, um, can... Lowell has his hand up too. Yeah, um, I'm really confused now because Tom is saying that the plant is in violation um, under the e according to the EPA, but DEC is telling us the exact opposite that the plant is in compliance. So I don't know who to believe at this point. Do I believe DEC? Do I believe what Tom's telling me the EPA is saying? There's something that is not adding up here and not everyone is working with the same information, obviously. And that's very confusing to me because I don't know which way to go at this point. Mr. Southwell, are you aware of any of the EPA non-compliance or no? Well, uh, I would uh, suggest that the, the, it could be that uh, we're looking at different, um, perhaps, standards. Uh, I mean, if you are late with a report, um, that's considered non-compliance. Um, if a, 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 if a, a result, a numeric uh, exceedance, uh, or you have a value of 30 and you get 31, um, reported 31, that could be considered non-compliance. Well, actually, you know what? I'm sorry. I probably should have asked Con Ed this than you because you're, you're just supposing. So oh, no, right. But, but what I'm saying to you just in general term, I mean, it, you can look at uh, data and say, oh, this is in, this is terrible. It's, this is in, uh, you know, you have non-compliance here. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, is it significant? Are uh, the explanations? Did you submit your report uh, a day or two late? Um, so, so then it, why don't we just ask Con Ed straight out? What what is non-compliant about this air? This or excuse me, or did you fail to report at all? Which is the primary elements in non-compliance, which is failure to do the DMR, the daily monitoring report. And if you're not monitoring, who the heck knows what you're putting into the river? That's the question, that's all. What is the question? Their, their primary non-compliance was failure to, issue, failure to uh, report their daily monitoring. Failure to report, not do it late, but they didn't report it. They didn't have the information. So- I don't have the EPA data in front of me. It sounds like you do, Tom. How many times was that? I have it in front of me. I have it for the last, for the, for the last uh, every quarter for the last three years, this uh, plant has been non-compliant. That's all I can for, for what? Again, I, I can't tell you what. Right, uh, but it's- I'd yeah. love to sit down with you and talk to specific- Wait, what? Rather than so, yeah, maybe you can you know, do that off, maybe offline. Yeah, that specific point. Yep. 
can be, I, I thought maybe it could be answered, but if it kind of doesn't have that information with them, Brad? Yes. If the full technical review, does it take in consideration of all these factors and also the EPA? Uh, can they get a permit? Or will these be brought up during that process in the next few months to, to, to address the issues Mr. Fox brought up? All factors are taken into um, when you do a full technical review. Um, all factors um, will be. And, and um, you know, I'm not sure if you're talking about the allegations of noncompliance um, or is is that yeah, that is of course so, so if you're going to issue a permit i mean you have to take in all the factors and when when we're being told it's a full technical review obviously i would assume that they're taking in all these issues can i can i just can i step in and i think i think selvin said that they are but i don't want to put words in his mouth i'll let him say that but you know just factually um De the EPA is the holder of the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act is EPA's law. DEC administers the Clean Water Act on behalf of the EPA. So if the EPA had a problem with this facility, A, we would have heard about it, and B, DEC would not be able to move forward with issuing a permit if the EPA didn't allow it. So I don't know if that, if that helps clarify things. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the point I was trying to make. Yeah, yeah, no, and it's I a good point. I think the bigger question here is, We've had some communication issue, issues, right? And and the bigger issue is it's taken six years to go through this technical review. So even with Mr. Fox bringing this up to light and putting his case forward, has at least brought this to our attention and hopefully get some resolution here. Um, but it, it, I think that's really our biggest problem here. So I'm hoping that the DEP really gets moving on this and, and we'll stick to by getting it by the end of the year. We would like to see that too. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Um, I think Mr. Walsh was brought over from the public. Uh, hi, I did not uh, raise my hand to speak on the Con Ed issue. So I, okay, I again, can you hold on. off one second then? Yeah, Is absolutely. That okay? There was someone else, Janine, I believe there was another. Oh, Caitlin. Yeah, Caitlin. Yes, hello. Go ahead. Um, I'm Caitlin Peterson. I have been volunteering at Pier 96, the kayaking program since 2011. Um, I co-founded the Manhattan Community Boathouse and have been helping to run that program since 2013. Um, I am not a chemist by training, so I just had a question about the slide about um, the quality standards for activities like swimming and the chemicals that were found in the water. Um, my understanding of the explanation of why those chemicals were there um, was that no one knows why they're there. And so I was wondering if there is any plan for additional testing to understand the origins and presence of those discharged chemicals. And if you can explain how that determination around safety for swimming is made, is that based on the concentration of one individual discharge? Is that based on infrequency overall? So we've decided that it's fine. Like understanding really how that determination is made would be very helpful. Um, for the questions that we get asked um, about water quality and just for peace of mind as someone who has been in that water every weekend from May to October for the last 13 years. Thank you. Does anyone want to handle that? Yeah, I'm assuming that's that's you, Selvin, for the yes. water quality determination. Yes. So the... the um... Uh, water waters are classified based on their best intended use, and the um, the concentrations of these various uh, compounds, pollutants, elements um, are are you know for for a particular classification. Obviously, uh, if you're for swimming um, or non-contact recreation you would have a, uh, a, a, a lower or stricter concentration of various chemicals uh, because of course it would not be, uh, it would not impact or cause health issues to someone who is swimming if that water body, say it's SA. SA is a, 
um, one of our, it's the top classification, sailing waters for swimming. Um, so you would have a low concentration of all the various um, chemicals for SA. Um, SB, S, SA, SB, SC, I think, are all um, are, uh, the best intended use for those classifications are um, swimming and non-contact recreation. So you would tend to see the same concentrations for those three um, are classifications. Now that has to do, classifications are based on a number of things, impact to um, uh, human health, also to uh, fish um, and aquatic life. Um, so if you are swimming in a water body that's classified as SA, um, you can be confident that um, whatever uh, chemicals or pollutants that are in that um, water body, um, they would not impact you um, or cause uh, health issues. Um, so that's kind of how, how it's done. Um, it's, it's strictly based on impact to uh, human health if uh, swimming is the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the classification. Um, I, I'm going to be super dense and just ask a clarifying question. Is mm -hmm. that overtime or is that at every moment at all times? Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> you know, if I'm in the water and these chemicals are being emitted less than a hundred yards away, am I safe in that moment? Yeah. I, I would say if you're not living in the water, you should be fine. You know, you, you, are you talking about the duration of yeah. your contact? Yeah, absolutely. The short answer is yes. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> you'd, you'd be fine. If, uh, if you know, you want to go diving. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, but of course, you know that, uh, well, I don't know if I want to get into this, but of course, you know, um, we have other issues with water yeah. bodies, um, yes. combined sewer overflows, mm -hmm. health advisories by the health department. I think so, um, the Hudson River is absolutely a choose your own adventure, like at your own risk environment. But exactly. I think understanding not having the knowledge until this article that this was a potential risk was definitely a cause for concern for me. So thank you. I really appreciate that answer. Yeah. And, and, and th those issues are perhaps more problematic than uh, the concentration of say selenium in or, or whatever other um, parameter you're concerned about. I see some other hands are up. Thank you very much for that. And Thank you, Caitlin, for, for coming. Um, uh, I see Graham and Tom again. I, I just want to make this really brief, if we can, guys, because we just want to, you know, tie this up because we have some community discussion on it. Sure. And it's the first week of school. So we do have school. <laughs> some of us, some of us have to get kids to school in the morning. <laughs> I'd just like to make a point that the city water that's being used could be disposed of in the city sewer system and go to North River Sewage Treatment Plant instead of directly into the Hudson River. Um, I just want to make a point that uh, the Hudson River at, at Pier 96 is classified by the DEC as I, which is secondary contact only. However, in practice, kayaking in New York City, as Caitlin mentioned, and I will concur, involves a lot of primary contact. All of the boats used for the public program at Pier 96 uh, sit on top kayaks. Everybody in those boats, including children and pregnant women, touches the Hudson. More importantly, any kayaker who wants to be safe on the harbour is going to be doing rescue practice. It's functionally the same as swimming. You need to be able to get back in your boat very, very quickly because you don't want to dump in the channel and get run over by the Queen Mary, right? And, and those big boats don't. Don't, don't stop and they don't change direction. So the DEC's classification for the Hudson River at Pier 96 is a joke, right? It does not reflect how kayaking operates safely in New York Harbor. Okay, thank you for that. And I, I see Frank from Con Ed, did you have your hand up for? 
yeah, I, I just wanted to to first of all thank thank Mr. Fox for his comments and then for his, his work, you know, looking out for the the aqua life and and the river. Uh, I I, I would we would welcome uh, a, a discussion. I, I believe our lawyers have reached out to the lawyers uh, for the suit, so we'd be happy. And we think that once the information is shared, and as many mentioned, the communication uh, the communication gaps are filled that that we feel you would be satisfied with the information we're able to provide. I, I did want to address quickly, um, you can't take a sample if the station's not running and a lot of the failure to comply issues are when the station's not running and we're required to take a sample, there's no sample to be taken. As I mentioned, the station only runs 25 to 35% of the year. Uh, you know, that that is not a non-compliance issue that harms the river per se. And, and we just wanna state that uh, many of those out of compliance issues are associated with almost administration fouls that uh, Venetia mentioned earlier, where if the station's not running, we, we, we can't do the sampling. Um, and I think if once we share that information with, with Mr. Fox and, and, and the group, I, I think we would be able to find a satisfactory course of action, as well as give the community board uh, a level of ease. We appreciate it and look forward to the opportunity and don't at all doubt your sincerity or professionalism. Uh, we're just dealing with the information available through freedom of information. That's all we had to look at. New, New York City cool. born and bred and a Brooklyn boy at heart. So, I'm, I, you know, the river is important to me as, as everyone else. So we'll, 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 we're very sincere about it. As, as, Thank as, you, as a way of helping close, close the conversation, my question for everybody is what is the best way for us to keep, uh, particularly with what Lowell was asking about the, the, the conflicting information, over the next couple of months, as I've understood the conversation, there will be a permit issued, whether it's before the end of the year or not, as uh, as uh, Sylvan was pressed to answer, isn't the point. What is the best way for us to receive further information and to monitor what's going on with the permit on uh, this pier? We would be happy to come back anytime um, and, and talk to the board. Um, again, there's there's no secrecy here. This is a, a transparent and public process and we're happy to participate in it and, and are sincerely um, grateful for this opportunity to put the facts out on the table. So, um, I, you know, probably the easiest way, I don't know, um, Kyle Kimball, you're here from um, from our government affairs group, um, if, if you want to weigh in on that, but certainly any any time you want us back, we're happy to come talk and, and keep you in the loop as this process moves forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you guys, I know this community board knows. Uh, my name is Kyle Kimball. I run government relations for Con Edison City, State, and Federal. Uh, Kimberly Williams, who opened this up, uh, is our head of our Manhattan practice. Happy to come back anytime uh, that folks would like us to, uh, or, or a regular cadence. Happy to do that. And we would be glad to report back to the community board after our meeting with Con Edison as well. That would be wonderful. It's also Great worth meeting. noting we're actually going to do uh, this was a this was a uh, uh, we're going to do this again uh, for uh, the Hudson River Park Advisory Council as well. So if, if anyone wants to be a part of that uh, and hear this all over again, uh, we can feel free to share that information. Thank you, Kyle. I was just told also that um, what you just said that I guess the uh, Hutter Park Advisory Council will be taking this up next week as well. Um, That's so, right. And our chair, C, uh, Jeffrey LaFrancois, has a seat on that, I believe, um, or is a rep for that for us on that for CB4. Co-chair, and it's on the 13th. Uh, and anybody who wants to, um, I'm sure Jeffrey can get you the invitation to the meeting so you can be informed. Great, thank all you, everybody. The, all the information for the AC is on the Hudson River, uh, Hudson River Park uh, under About Us in the Advisory Council, or on our events calendar. With the it's a Zoom with has a link there. Thank you, guys. Um, Con Ed, really, thank you. That was a really in depth um, presentation, uh, and I just want to say I, I really think this is a great use of the community board. That yeah. it's just, it, this is really a really good example of um, just open information and just like letting people talk back and forth civilly and getting hopefully questions answered. I also want to thank DEC for coming. Um, this is all, and uh, of course, always Hudson River Park Trust. I mean, this was a little bit of short notice, um, at least somewhat. 
So thank you, really, thank you. This is wonderful. Um, and I guess you, you guys can leave because we're going to talk Thanks. about, I guess we're going to talk yeah. amongst ourselves for about a letter. But thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank Tom, you. thank All you right. very much. You're welcome. I'm sorry, before this ends, I'm, I just wanted to confirm that there will not be a motion for this. Well, Saturday. that's what we're going to talk about, Janine. Okay, thank you. With the committee. Okay. Madam Chair, now that we have Con Ed, can they talk about shore power? Next shore time? power, Brad. Uh, can I tell you something? You, you read my mind. Maybe, maybe we can we can do something with this where they can they can uh, put shore power in for our for. Our I mean, the times that it's not using it, maybe we can bring it up there. I mean, let's. It was great to have them. Yeah, thank you guys. Um. Okay, now for the committee, Marty. Do you want to? Uh, I mean, if I would love to hear from the committee if anyone thinks this is some sort of a letter. Um, I wrote down a bunch of notes. I don't know if we want to talk about the EPA noncompliance and get more clarity on that. If we want to talk about where the chemicals in the water that was mentioned that evidently does not come from Con Ed, are they going to further test for that? Is it necessary? Um, the obvious six year time frame so far. Uh, um, unless, unless somebody has stronger feelings than, than I do about what I'm going to say, uh, I, I think Lowell expressing the uh, contradiction that we've heard put us in a position where we really need to get some additional information before we write a letter. And that additional information won't come until that drafting of the permit. So I'm one, I mean, we're not, we don't want to influence the drafting of the permit. Uh, that doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, shouldn't we treat this as, as a wonderful informational experience and not write a letter? That's m what my gut says. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe. Uh, but uh, how do we get the information without asking for it? Leslie, well, can I make a suggestion? Yeah, go ahead. Why don't we ask all of the parties who were here tonight to come back to us at some future date and tell us where they've gotten in their discussions. And we can write a letter putting a pox on all of their houses if we want to at that point. Um, but they seem, it seems that City Club and Tom need to sit down with the trust and Con Ed and DEC and I don't know that we need to be in the room for that to happen. Um, and I'd almost like to encourage them to do that and let us know what's going on after they've had some conversations. I think you've just written the letter that we should write, which is thank you for coming. Uh, we look forward to a report back from you early next year. Or even sooner, but I, I think the most important thing to come out of tonight is to get these parties talking to each other and attempting to share information and resolve any conflicts. And like I said, I don't think CB4 needs to be in the room for that. Um, if people feel otherwise, feel free to shout me down. Um, but that, that's my gut on this right now. Um, if I may. Oh, Gwen, go ahead. Oh, um, I was just going to, God, now I don't remember what I was going to say. Never mind. Uh, Carl, I think you had your hand up. Did you take it down? I'm sorry. Did you take it? I mean, I was just going to, I just agree with Lowell. I mean, I think that there were some concrete next steps that they all sort of committed to and agreed to in, in this meeting uh, about further discussing, and then they can come back to us. I'm not sure that uh, writing a letter for the sake of writing one is necessarily on at this point for us. Um, you know, if they, if, if those conversations break down or they're not satisfactory, then we can maybe visit. But uh, for me, I think there were some clear next steps and, you know, pledges to work together that um, satisfied me. I think, I think that's right. Jeffrey, lurking in the shadows of our meeting. A rarity for me, Leslie, uh, but thank you. I was gonna say, how'd you keep I, quiet? How'd you keep quiet I, in this I, meeting? Wow. I think it's prudent and appropriate to memorialize this evening in the form of a letter, given concerns about transparency across all agencies um, and to make sure that we are on record acknowledging participation 
calling out a few questions and like Lowell said, requesting that they come back with more information when they progress further down the line. So as board chair, are you allowed to make a motion for a letter? I'm not, I'm not on the committee. I leave it to one of my good colleagues to do so. Actually, Jeffrey, you're ex officio of every committee. Yeah, I was gonna say, of course you are part of the committee. Well, I still leave it to the committee. <laughs> you know, uh, anyone or comments on, I mean, now that the chair has weighed in? Uh, I, I did remember what I was gonna say. What I was Go gonna ahead, say Glenn. is with the um, proposal about the, the water going into the Hudson, we can ask that they notify us of any public hearings. And we should do that probably. And some of us may wanna go. Okay. I think that's fair as well. Um, so now that the chair, our esteemed chair has weighed in, I don't think that it would be beyond us to write a short letter thanking people for coming. And also I do think the transparency issue, um, listen, there's the technical issues, right? Of the water going in, the water going out, the temperatures, but there's also the overall transparency issues. And personally, it does bother me a little when people who have worked with the trust or worked with the park for so long had zero knowledge of this, whether it was part of some sort of public comment session or not, you would think, or the kayaking people, or just someone would would know, it might not necessarily have been as big of a deal. I, I don't I, I don't know. Um, so Jeffrey, when you said in the letter, you would like to ask for transparency across the board, was there anything more to that than just a general ask of, we want to know? I mean, I think, so as you mentioned, the Hudson River Park Advisory Council, that meeting is next Tuesday. Um, I think the discussion there, um, if I have a hunch having served on that committee for the past couple of years, uh, will, be a, will be a lot more about transparency and how the, the trust and DEC um, as government authorities notify the public about changes or leases or anything coming down the pike. And so I'm hesitant to have this committee sort of jump in on that tonight since the thrust of the discussion was very much about the technicalities of what takes place at Pier 98. Uh, but I also feel strongly this is not the last time Board 4 or you know the Advisory Council will be taking this up. So I think we stick to the thanks and please return in due time for an update. Great, David. Yeah, I would ask in the letter that uh, upon their return, they focus on outstanding differences uh, so that we can kind of focus in on what the outstanding issues are. And, uh, you know, maybe a further letter can come out of that that addresses ways of resolving that in the future and satisfying both parties. Okay, so. So do you think we come out with just a thank you, an informal, not a letter, an informal, whether it's be administrative, just thank you for coming. We look forward to having you back. Um, yes. And hopefully the transparency issues can resolve themselves between um, on this topic and others and that's it. And just, and just wait like Lowell and Jeffrey. And I think Marty said originally. We, we encourage you to address the transparency issues and share as much information as each side needs. Yes. Okay, we can definitely, that can be an informal thank you. Janine, I guess you heard that whole thing. Uh, yes, can we get a vote for it too? Sure. Um, it actually almost sounds like an administrative letter. That's what, I, that's what I was thinking, just an administrative letter saying, thank you, this is what we expect and kind of to at least semi-formalize it. Um, if the people, David, I believe in Gwen, if you could put your hands down so we could do the a vote. Or Gwen, I'm sorry, were you gonna say something? No, go ahead. I thought it was up to you before. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. The, the, the meeting is next week for the advisory council. And when is that you said? Jeffrey, do you know when that is? It's Tuesday. Tuesday, 6.30. Um, I can, sh that, that is on, when it's on the Hudson River Park 
uh, trust website. There's an advisory okay. council section, and I'll I will share the information um, with the the committee and have Jesse circulate that around as well. Great. Con Ed is also having a Zoom meeting for the public on the 28th Street substation and at exactly the same time. Okay, so if we can, I guess we can vote on the, what we just talked about, the parameters in the form of this correspondence. Um, so why don't we do this? Well, why don't we just do all, all in favor, put your raise your hand function of doing what Lowell and David and Marty and then Jeffrey suggested. And I'll put my hand up too. Oh, right, Janine, you have that. And then actually, let's see. Uh, there's a, oh, there goes Brad. I don't see Katie. I don't know if Roberta is on. Why don't we take those down then? And then put if anyone opposes and they want either nothing or, or something more formal. Um, any opposing, please put your hands up. Great. I, th I think Brad was from before. And I'm present, not eligible. Yeah. Lola's P &E. I'm sorry, Brad was yes or no? Brad, I believe, was yes. I'm, I'm a yes, but I would like to add not next year, about 60 days or 45, you know. Like a timeline. We, we yeah. Put some timeline on it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and just to clarify, I know you mentioned it was, it, it, it'll be an admin letter or a full, a full board letter? Admin. Admin, okay, thank you. Doesn't need to go to the full board. No. Okay. Great, we can put a bow on that. I know, um, can I say one thing about this conversation that we just had so that we can move into whatever's next? I, there was a lot of work done to get all these people together. I think Janine played a role in it. I think I know that Leslie played a big role in it and uh, Jesse played a, a role in it. It was, it was a valuable conversation. Thank you. I, I, I learned a lot from it. Thanks, Marty. Uh, Michael, I know you were brought over from the public to speak on something. I don't, uh, I don't know if this is the right time. I have some new business I wanted to bring before the board. Okay, this is actually part of, we're going into new business. Uh, actually, we have one more um, item. Is that okay? So we're gonna do fine. one more item. Yeah. And uh, this is really just more administrative and informative. So as many of you know, we are coming to that time of year where we have, and present our MCB4 statement of district needs and budget requests. Um, I think most people here are familiar with that, but just in case it's where we as a community board prioritize our asks, our capital um, asks and uh, our expense asks throughout every committee. So now what this committee um, would concentrate on is what we think is important or what we think, what projects we wanna prioritize, um, where we think financing should go. Um, and then we will discuss that, we'll prioritize it, and then it'll go through to the budget task force. Um, so that was just, we don't have to discuss that now. Uh, in your Dropbox, you will see what we asked for and our statement of district needs for this particular committee. Um, it's in the Dropbox right now for last year. Uh, there are a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot. There are some wins on that. Penn State, uh, Penn State, Penn South um, playground renovation being one of them. So we can cross that off our list uh, as an example. Now, the one thing is we, with, with this process, we don't just come up with everything. It's usually something that we've talked about, something that we've written a letter on, something that we've discussed. So if you guys have anything in your heads or anything that's important to you, email us and we can put on the agenda for next week. We could talk about it. Um, but really, right, Marty, it's stuff that we've already discussed and or we have already noted as a priority or need. Um, sure power. Just keep that in mind. Shore just power, Shore power, just, I think, was number one last year. Just for an example, 
Right. Yeah. But that's an example of what we would be talking about. And we started as Brad yeah. brought it up. Yeah. I mean, everything from shore power to putting new swing sets in uh, to win Clinton, anything. So um, it's just really just want to give everyone a heads up that that's coming down the pike. That's coming next month, the month after. And then we're really going to form our our statement of district needs. And then uh, what we do is we come together with the other committees and then we'll prioritize them. And hopefully all WPEs will be on top. And that's it. So um, does anyone have any questions or comments about that? No? Okay, any no, uh, old and new business from our committee? Because if not, then we can go to Mr. Walsh who has been so patiently waiting. Go ahead, Michael. Hi, uh, thank you all. Um, if anyone who doesn't know me, I am the current president of the Friends of Chelsea Green. And so I've come to you tonight because we have uh, an issue that's come up in the park this summer is we have an infestation of rats. And uh, I get contacted uh, on a regular basis from people telling me it started with, I see rats at 5 a.m. when I walk my dog. And now it's become, uh, I'm in the park with my kids and rats are here with us. So the rats have gotten very bold and uh, they're running around the park at four o'clock in the afternoon when the park is, as if you've ever been by, you know, is always very busy. Um, we have been, I have forwarded all these comments to, to the parks department and I've asked them repeatedly for updates on when they're doing service in the park and um, we're not getting enough information from them. Uh, we have been in touch with Councilman Botcher's office and Jordan Finer is helping to set up a meeting with Eric and uh, I believe some relevant individuals in the park. But I, I come to see before because I, in what I've learned about this, that I think it's it's kind of beyond parks because we have gotten information that there is rat activity in some of the, the buildings neighboring the park. And I feel like if we don't put together a response that involves the park and the buildings around it, we're never going to get a hold of this issue because the rats are just going to move to another location uh, to avoid to avoid extermination and other things. So. So I've, uh, we've come to you just for some help and maybe you can help coordinate some of this at a future meeting that we could talk with multiple agencies and try to put a solution to this. And uh, I know other parks have been through this. So if you have any feedback, uh, we'd love to hear from you. You know, Michael, Sally Greenspan, as you know, is a member of this committee. Unfortunately, she, she can't be here today because she's traveling. So, yeah. and I know she's very involved, obviously. Uh, which we, have, we have talked, she knows everything. Yeah, but, no, I, I, you were on the email that she CC'd me. Yeah. So, I think actually, Janine, if we can, because I know we're going to have a very lengthy discussion with um, New York City Parks about other things. Can we just, can you just note it that we want to talk with them about this as well? Because I do know that you guys have aggressively asked the inquired uh, about this situation. Mm. And I actually think it's a shame when you have to go to your council member. Well, people have taken it upon themselves. To get a rat, some oh. sort of a rat mitigation. Yeah. The people who use the park have taken it upon themselves to file 311 uh, complaints. And we, we actually started encouraging people because we feel like we need a, a good track record. And I know um, the councilman office has, has is aware of those. Um, but yeah, we just we need more information because we need to communicate to people because people are they're concerned, they're scared, they're upset. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's doing damage to the community that we built in the park. And you know what, Michael, I see that Sean Coughlin, who is um, council member Botcher's chief of staff just was put over. Sean, I'm guessing because you want to respond or have some sort of comment or, or maybe you uh, just I was actually going to talk about the statement of district needs, but I can oh. talk about this as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Michael. Uh, yeah, as you said, Jordan from our office is working on this, has been in touch with Therese and Steve Simon from Parks. Uh, we agree that their response has been unsatisfactory, which is why we're working to schedule the site visit with them and Carolyn Bragdon from the Department of Health, who's the rat specialist. Uh, anyone who's attended one of the rat academies has heard from Carolyn and knows that she's an expert on the matter. So hopefully we should have a date on the books in the next week or two to get everybody on the site and talk about what we can do to improve the situation. We're very grateful for the advocacy of you and Sally on this issue and know it's really important. Thank you, Sean. All right, so Michael, we'll definitely, uh, we, we have a list hopefully with parks um, that we can address with them for next month and Great. this will be on it. All Absolutely. right, thank you. 
All Thank right, you. great. Thanks. So we brought some other people here so that just to, people are concerned. So we, we, I had some friends who, I don't know if they're still here, but they wanted to come. No, it was a long meeting and I, yeah. I understand. And, and um, Sally is definitely a good advocate for you. She's just not here tonight, as you know. I know. Well, I'm, well, I'm happy for her because she's traveling. Yeah. <laughs> Visit Thank with you. us next month. Great. Well, I hope to come back and maybe we will make some progress in the next month that we can report on. But thank you all. Thanks thank for your you. Time. And Sean, you said you want to comment on district needs. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate. First of all, great meeting. Uh, I like Jeffrey a little bit. I was also slinking around in the background listening. It was really fascinating. And we appreciate all the dialogue. Uh, and I just want to reiterate your point about the importance of the statement of district needs, especially as it uh, applies to the Penn South playground, you know, the the communications with community board for and their prioritization of that site was why Eric fought so hard to get the $4 million from the speaker and the mayor to get that renovation. So we really appreciate community boards for his advocacy on the priorities of the community. And we plan to work closely with you all and uh, with Kit and Alan on school priorities as well. So, you know, I know it can sometimes feel like the statement of district needs is shouting into a void, but that is not going to be the case. We are going to pay close attention to it as we make our asks of the administration and the speaker's office. So thank you all for your work. We really appreciate it. Sean, I I just heard that you were going to fund Sean Power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me personally. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I'm setting up a lemonade <laughs> stand on the river. It's going to be great. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Sean. We will. Don't we'll pour any over it. Sean, just don't pour any lemonade into the river. Um, Fox will sue you. Low. Especially, um, especially near Pier 98. Okay, anyone else with new business? That's it? Does everyone want to leave or do you want to keep going? No, let's leave. A motion to adjourn? Uh, second. Or Thank you, members. everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say yeah. one thing. Yes, uh, go ahead, Brett. Chicago. They're giving permits out for taxi drones. I knew it. Thank we you. are missing out. I Thank sent you. the article <laughs> to our chair, but we really need to be talking about what's happening on the waterfront and where to put these type of things because they're pushing the fact that it's going to bring down traffic. So I just, you know, we need to be thinking and talking about these things. Thank you. Brad, not, not to be funny, but did you talk to Christine about for transportation on that? Really, like for the with the taxi, the transportation committee. Uh, no, I have not. I sent it to our chair. Okay. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, motion to adjourn. I guess again. Sorry, Carl, you did it, and then I think Tina seconded it. Second and it second. It. Great. We adjourned Thank you guys. five minutes ago, but it's nice seeing you all. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Great meeting. Bye. Thank you. Guys. See you next month. Good night, everybody.